Hello and welcome to the Nash Tackle Off The Hook podcast. Just to make you aware, this podcast may contain some explicit slash offensive language. And if that's not your thing, you don't have to listen. But I have given you a warning. I hope you enjoy the rest of the show. You don't know the half of it, but yeah, um, I'm anyway. Time, yeah, I'm, good, on, mate. I'm skating on the thinnest <laughs> ice known to man. Like. He said, and um, they put a poison in the tank that just instantly kills them. He went, and we've run out of it, so we cut their heads off with shovels. Suddenly, bang! The whole boat exploded. Take your sort of eight-inch-long piranha and imagine that at four, five, maybe six feet. I said, I've revived your dead fish. <laughs> F off, he said. You haven't. That was just humongous. It was... I couldn't believe what I was looking at. I'm just battling this fish out and on. I know it's a black man. I'm, yeah. I'm saying I'll never be a naughty boy again. If you catch fish and you return them to the water, then you are my brother. Finn Lewis, welcome to the Nash Podcast, mate. How are you? Yeah, I'm very well, thank you. How are you? I'm very good, mate. Very, very good to have you in here, mate. In sunny Essex, you brought the sun with you. I know, it's nice. It is nice. It's very lovely. I think... In terms of you, I mean, the Wild Man series, it's hypocrisy. I think a year ago, roughly, is when I probably first was aware of you publicly. A few of the lads in the office who frequented some of the old Essex River have seen you or known about you in terms of your angling. But it's fair to say, and I think probably the most standout thing for you is those that might not have seen the hypocrisy content that you've done the Wild Man series, you're pretty unique when it comes to. Uh, I won't say carp fishing, mate, because you do more than just carp fishing, but you're quite unique in sort of your angling and where you sit. Would you say that's fair? Um, I'd say it's very kind of you to say so, Hassan. <laughs> I appreciate that. Um, yeah, I'd say maybe I'll do things a little bit differently than the, probably the most, I don't know, commercial carp fishermen who sit around the day ticket or spend £700 on a syndicate. I don't know. I've never really been one to do that. I've never been a member of a syndicate. Never, ever. No, never, never. I've joined a few club lakes, you know, and that's about it. The rest of it's do what you want and where, go where you can, do you know? There is that sort of whole free... What did I say before? I said you were Ray Mears, Bear Grills, and Jeremy Wade yeah, sort we, of all rolled in. We were, yeah, we was Jeremy Grills. Jeremy Grills, <laughs> mate. Like. But it is that sort of, um, yeah, sort of very different, but free, quite, like, I don't know how you deem it, very resourceful in terms of how you go about things. But unique you haven't even done the polar opposite you you mentioned their day ticket lakes and that sort of type of carp fishing but you you haven't even done the sort of big fish target fishing on popular syndicates or or sort of known big ones. you don't even do that type nah, of thing, do you? don't get you wrong like i'd love to catch loads of big ones and you see the pictures on instagram and like mm. when carp talk was about and you'd be like oh my god i'd do anything to have that in your album but it's just i don't know it's getting there and doing it. I didn't really... And you've got to be in the rat race. Uh, and I don't like the rat race. Down the, lake, down the river, you've got a few pike fishermen mucking about or like geezer on a tip fishing rod. But the rest is to yourself, innit? And I think that syndicate... I'm not a big fish fisherman and I don't like fishing around other people. So it kind of... It's not my style, you know? As much as the fish are lovely and you'd love to have them in your album, it's not... Um, Where does that come from, mate? Because it's quite the thing to... How old are you? Give me twenty eight. I'm twenty nine this year. So it's quite July. It's, it's quite interesting that somebody from that sort of age, and I'm not talking down in terms of age, but you're like ten years younger than me, nearly. There's a massive that you sort of developed through a massive load of media and sort of publicity around certain styles of angling, certain mm. fish, and all that. Yet you still sort of retained quite a sort of very unique within yourself path to your angling. Where do you think that comes from? Oh, without a shadow of doubt, my old man, really. Yeah? Yeah, yeah. Um, my old man was pretty much like Mr. Crabtree. Right. Do you remember Mr. Crabtree, yeah, the old yeah. books, like, years ago, Bernard Venables and that? Yeah. That was him all over. Like, my old man hated carp fishing. Hated it. He couldn't, like, he used to go fucking bloaters. I mean, what do you bloaters? Wanna, bloater fishing. What do you want to go do that for, do you know? And as a kid, that kind of set the way for like what I liked because obviously everyone wanted to be like their dad so I'd be like yeah dad fuck the car I don't want to do that and you'd like and it gets you into your roach fishing it gets you into your chub fishing and where it always take us down the river it was almost like I didn't know any other way like a lot of people would might if your dad was into carp fishing he was a member of a syndicate he was a little boy you'd go down there with your dad and you kind of got introduced that way yeah but mine was completely opposite he kind of introduced me into the 
the wilder side of fishing, you know, down the rivers, peaceful, sitting in the meadow fields, you know, horses on your back, like, it's that, with the, with the yeah, you kind of proper set the tone for how how fishing, not supposed to be or meant to be, but like just that, that way, you know, and. Where I did just, carp come in then? For you? So, oh man, different... quite late in life, like honestly, yeah. um, I was probably 17, 18, so like only 10 years ago. And I've got friends who are like 18, 19 years old now, and they've had cat. Like my mate Toby, he's only 19, he's had like untold 30s and fished the syndicate waters, and like it's completely opposite. And I think I'd love to have your albums, but I'm never gonna, do you know, because I've always done it a bit different. But um, I suppose it started tench fishing. Right. So I was about 17, 18, member of a little club, Lake. And because um, my old man loved tench fishing, the pike season's finished, you get into the spring, didn't you? So um, you go tench fishing with the old man, you know, you go and buy your pint of maggots, get a few feeders and that. And I was sitting down there, um, tied up a few tench rigs, got them out. About a few hours later, um, Rod's gone. It was an 18 pound common. And it was like one of my first, uh, I think it was like my first double figure carp, you know? Yeah. Um, and I was like, fucking hell, look at this. Like, and he'd give a fight and that. And obviously, I was much more of a pleasure fisherman then. I, I didn't really target big fish. It was more if I want to catch tench, don't matter what how big. If I want to catch chub, it don't matter. Just as long as you catch like your desired species, it was like a win win, you know. Mm. Um, but catching a carp is like the bycatch, you know. Like oh, this just turned up and it's a, up a double. It was like fucking bloody hell. Yeah, when they give a fight, you, yeah, it kind of excited me enough that I went back the following week. Um, and I fished the exact same. I, uh, to tell a lie, I bought my first tube of PVA. Um, Here we go. St- like I mesh. bought my first tube of PVA mesh and I put a massive, I, don't, I can't believe I haven't done it, but I put the biggest sock <laughs> of maggots I could possibly get onto the hook and I've lobbed it out there and lo and behold, the following morning, I've had another common, same sort of size. And I thought, oh my God, there's something to this. You know what I mean? I've got this, mate. I've got this. It's cracked it, mate. Carp yeah. fishing, I've like, completed it. Do you know what I mean? I'm a tench fisherman. I've done it. Um, and it kind of just progressed and progressed. And like the following week, I'd go back and I'd give it another go and I'd catch another one. So I remember like, so the first week I had the 18 pound common at tench fishing. Then the second week I had, it was like 17 pound common tench fishing again. Then the third week, I, obviously I say I'm tench fishing, but I'm kind of half in my head thinking, well, a, a carp's on the cards and all. Yeah. Um, and to see if it would, I don't know why I'd done it, but to see if I could, because I like to start mucking about different baits. When I when you're going about Mr. Crabtree and things like that. Yeah, yeah. In the book, it would be like, I found a slug on the bank this morning, put that on. So I was like, in the morning, I've got a slug off the bank and put it on the hair, lopped that out. So I've got like a slug on one rod and I've got maggots on the other. And the slug went and it was my PB tench, eight and a half pound. No, on a slug. So I was like, happy days, mate. And then the other rod's gone in. It was a it was a mirror, like 22. So now I've just had a PB. Not on a slug? No, nah, not on a slug. That was on the maggots. But it would have been cool to catch a 20 on a slug. Yeah. Um, but that was like my PB then. I've had my first 20 pound cart. That's pretty quick that you've had a 20 as well, isn't it? Yeah, f- three sessions in. But obviously it's a club water. It's a carp lake. Mm. Um what was the um, old man's reaction to that? Was he? Was... He, to be fair, he said he went. He was quite impressed with it because it was. He was like, "That's a proper looking one." Because he said, oh, "I ate the ones with the big old bellies." Said you could cut them off and you'd lose twenty pound, and you'd be all like that. Like yeah. that's why they were called bloaters. You know what I mean? I got it. But um, when they were proper fish shape, you know, nice size, not with the big double bellies and that. He loved it. Yeah, he really like had a, like liked them. And I think that's probably why I liked the river carp so much because to me they were kind of a bit more, as the old man would say, proper carp. You know, yeah, no bloaters. you don't get the big swollen up ones in the river. They're a bit torpedoey, male looking cricket bats half the time, <laughs> isn't they? But, yeah, that really sowed the seed for me. Tench fishing, and then like obviously it diversifies you into the carping because it's so close your methods and yeah. what you do. And when I look back at it, the reason I was catching the carp is because I'm using like six pound hook link and like eight pound line and a tiny little feeder and a, a size 10 hook. So no wonder I was catching them pretty yeah. quick, you know, and these geese next door got a size four on a combi or something, a big old four ounce lead. I look back to it and I should have never have like 
gone too far into the carp yeah. fishing. I should have been like the tench fisherman who catches loads of carp. It's funny that, like, it's funny you say that. I was having this conversation with somebody the other day. Like, you go, you sort of, it goes in fads. You go from one extreme to the other. So if you go to a car, if you go to like a, a, a tench lake that's got some carp in it and you fish like a bunch of casters or whatever, invariably you'll catch carp. hundred percent. Right? The carp have been hammered on like casters and that. And then you go and like fish, or, or there's tench in that same lake. You go and fish massive boilies. You'll probably catch the tench, not the carp. Mate. It's unbelievable how quick it can, like, you yeah, know. It's and, and that's all about fishing, you know. So I, that's why some are better than others, I think, or luckier than others. Yeah. But going back to the the, yeah, go the on, maggots, um, that exact club lake, what I was doing all the tench fishing on, the, the big one in there, only come out to tench anglers. Never come off yeah. a boilie, but if like a tench angler would sit there, like, you know, you get your 80-year-old retired tench <laughs> anglers going down there on a Wednesday and Thursday yeah. for like three hours in the morning, you know, just to get away from the missus. It'll be them geezers, you catch it. And I'd think, mate, every time, like... And the next thing, in the you and you, all your mates, where you've got so far into your carp fishing, that now you've got the boilies in your bag. But yeah. the following week, you'd get the maggots back out. I think that you could do it again. And it was like the constant battle of like, are you a, spe- like a specimen angler or are you yeah. just getting the boilies out? You're finding your way. What, what were your influences then in terms of like carp fishing? Did you like follow all the media? Did you read all um, that? Or did, were you very much just sort of your own? So back then. Um, You're 18, 19. I'm just thinking that is, yeah, that is 10 years It was years probably ago. Sky, what was it? What was the TV program? Tight lines. Um, oh, when I was younger, it would be all like Total Fisher and Matt Hayes, yes. wouldn't it? Um, and Mick Brown. Then it was like John Wilson go fishing. There G-Bad was all them. All so, yeah. so like, and obviously it would be like different species each week. So one day it would be the carp, wouldn't it? Yeah. And I remember Matt Hayes, um, he was surface fishing something. He was using red fishing line, wasn't he? And it, I remember do you that. remember that yeah, one? Yeah. He had a 40 off the top with the red fishing that's line. And I thought, isn't it? oh, that's edgy, that is. And I remember getting some red fishing line, like thinking, Matt Hayes, here we come. But as far as being influenced, um, everyone used to watch like the Thinking Tackle when you was kids and that because it was yeah. on TV. And that was like the first like cart fishing sort of thing on TV, wasn't it? And you just get lost into the abyss. Like it's a, when I look back, it's a total head fuck in it. Do you know what I mean? Oh, of course, mate. There's a lot of Because you can get completely yeah. Bogged submersed down. and lost. And one week it's like, oh, solid PVA bag to the one. You want to fish them tight to an island. And the next thing you know, it's like, no, that ain't what you want to do. It's this. And half of it is just do whatever you want. You'll catch them. But a lot of influences, probably down the, down the lake itself, you know, because yeah. I'm 18, 19, there's a lot of fully grown blokes around there. And where I don't know, like, I was always quite open to like punish someone a little bit or ask them a few things. And then like, all of a sudden, someone give you a couple of like pop ups that have caught them a few fish, you know, or you get to hear about what bait's done all right, or and you get kind of sucked into that, like, oh, I'm only using this bait and I'm only going to use this rig because that's the only one that's catching. And do you know, so a I lot, know, yeah, yeah. At the beginning of my cart fishing, maybe I got a bit too tunnel visioned, like mm. maybe single minded. I don't really know how to put it, but I kind of lost my, I wouldn't put a slug on. That sort of thing. Yeah, yeah. You kind of get drawn away from that because everything's so written out and done for you. You kind of feel, it's almost like you start following instead of leading yeah, sort definitely. of thing. And yeah, like, yeah, I didn't put a slug out for ages. It was just so many boilies all the time. And it did, it did slow me down a bit, I think. I should have just stayed that weird, find sank on the floor and fry it out and I've probably done better. You say, you say that, but what I've seen recently, and I think probably and you'll tell me different if not, throughout the course of sort of your growing up and your life now, that sort of uniqueness, that sort of ability to be able to sort of create your own path, but also be very practical in what you do, experimenting, that's transcended into just your life because you don't live, and this is a very broad generalisation, you don't live what would be considered a normal life, do you? Mm, For instance, you don't live in a house you don't have a nine to five so to speak you do a lot of stuff that is it is unique to you isn't it in terms of your life and how you've created yeah it. yeah i definitely say like you said i mean i live in a nice mobile home with the missus yeah do you know i'm a bit more free in that way i ain't got a mortgage so i ain't got to worry about i've got to be at work today because otherwise my life's going to fall apart i mean if work dries up i can go fishing and when it comes back i can save my money you know so I'm very free in that way, definitely. And it does help to, to, I don't know, get down the river more and catch more fish, I suppose. And it's more like quality of life as well, isn't it? No one wants to be down the lake 
contemplate, oh, I should be at work today. I've got no money. And yeah. I'm kind of very much, when I'm fishing, I am just enjoying that. I ain't got to worry about home problems because quite a lot of time I'm pretty cushy at home, you know? I'm quite a content person when I, yeah, when I, I think of it that, like that. Mate. But you've created that, haven't yeah, you? Yeah, yeah, massively. Um, it's taken years. And don't get you wrong, it's taken a lot of like, fa- like failed friendships or failed relationships um, where people maybe don't quite understand the path that I wanted to to ride, you know? Some people do want to kind of, not hinder it, but let's say I'm quite selfish with my time. The only reason I get to do everything I want and I've got the lifestyle I've got is because at some point or another, I've probably been quite selfish, you know? And I've made right. sure that I've got what, I, it sounds bad, but made, not just made sure I've got what I wanted, but at the end of the day, it is your life. And if you want to be happy, it's got to be within you, not waiting for someone else to do it, you know? So for you, if I talk about your life and and the, and what you've created, with regards to what that looks like and what's important, we've talked about the fact that you you ain't got a mortgage, you haven't got all that sort of tie stuff, but also for you, your time, you can pretty much pick and choose what you do in accordance with you haven't got to be in an office somewhere nah, or do whatever. Nah. What else is important to you? My family. I've got a twin brother. Got a twin brother called Jamie. I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah, he's four minutes older than me, so I'm the youngest one out of two. But like he, do you know, I've come into this world with someone, and I've, I've cherished that for 28 years. Like he is my best friend. I love him more than anyone, other than Doris, my little terrier. Good old Doris, who what is a sat coat. on my lap right now. What a coat! You wouldn't even know a dog's in here, would you? You're like matching camo, mate. Yeah, You'd go that's to like it. Milan she loves it. Week. But um, <laughs> yeah, just my close friends, my family. Obviously, when you get to this age. You kind of only have your handful of close mates and you like to think you've picked the right ones to last you your life, didn't you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So like, I, I cherish my friendships, you know, the people are close to me and my brother. I've got a couple of sisters and obviously my missus and my dog. Like, so. What's your bro like? Is he like you? Um, oh, just as wild. Yeah, yeah, Is yeah. Just, but he's not, he's not so much. I'm a bit too mad at the fishing. Like I said, we were talking earlier before we come on this. Yeah. Um, going back to probably why I failed relationships, things like that, because to try and tell someone that it's not a hobby and it's a lifestyle yeah. is a very big ask. And if people ain't willing to like join your lifestyle, that's what I probably mean by I'm selfish is I've picked my lifestyle and people have either got to be involved in mine and not change it or I don't really want nothing to do with it. Mm. Do you know, that's probably why my missus is so good with me now because she's very happy with my lifestyle and now it's ours, you know, she's, yeah, she, she gets it. Yeah, exactly. She gets it completely. Um, but Jamie's not so mad about the fishing. It's a hobby for him. Yeah. You know, it ain't a lifestyle to my brother. He'll come with me and he's quite happy to not even get a rod out and he'll just sit there. And we sit there having a cup of tea and he'll watch me catch one and he'll be my net man. And like, he'll get my wicked photos. And, but then other times he'll bring his rod and he'll do all right. And it, do you it's know, good, mate. it's good that you're tight. That's, that's nice. Yeah. In terms of like being resourceful and making things, because you're always like, we talked about Kip before this, and just yeah. botching things together and being able to sort of, it is almost like, I don't know, like a generational thing. There's a lot of people when there weren't as much tackle prevalent or things about that we have now, we're fortunate to have, they had to engineer something themselves. Mate, but you've still got that mentality. Oh, 100%. I mean, what greater feeling is there? Then to make something, especially like make something on the bank, you know, when you forgot saying you, you got to make like a rod rest out of a fucking twig or I don't know, just the most random of things. But to catch on it when you're there as well, you think I wouldn't accord that if I didn't have a bit of initiative. Yeah. And that's a, like, that's evolution. It's fine. It's, you know, that's how we become a human race. Like, because we adapted and overcome like when we needed to, like, ne- what do they say? Necessity is the mother of all invention. Isn't yeah, it? Yeah. Yeah. Nice. You know, and, um, my first ever cart fishing bank, my first ever cart fishing rod rests, um, when I obviously tench fishing over Boverton's it was, a little club lake in Hatfield Peveril. I'm sitting in one of the swims and someone's obviously lost the top bit of their century bank sticks. So like the bit that sleeves yes, in, yeah? Yes, and you obviously yeah, screw yeah. And I've took this to my dad and gone, dad, I want a pair of these, but I've only got this one bit. It's the bit that you screw bank stick into and it's obviously sleeves into the rod rest, yeah? Mm. So I've given him that and I've gone back a couple of days later and my old man has made me a pair of stainless steel bank sticks Legend. that's like obviously adjustable on his lathe in his shed. 
Do you know what I mean? So it is massively it's from, like, your, it's from my old very man, first rod rests. Like my dad made me on his lave. You know what I mean? And my pike rods before that were like ten mil threaded bar, and my old man's just welded a Y on the top of them. So it so is like, your old man, isn't yeah. It? So like my old man, like just used to hit my my wheel uh, my wheel Barra, my yeah. wheelbarrow. Do you know what I mean? That is a wheelbarrow from B and Q, and he's just cut the top off it and put a few bits of wood on it. 25 years later, I'm still using it. Do you know what I mean? So, <laughs> like, why? Fair if there was anything play. made out of metal or if anything could be made with, like, glued with araldite or whipped on or, do you know what I mean, stuck together, you didn't buy it. No way. Do you know? Like, same as all the bobbins when we were kids. They were fairy up liquid bottle tops. Yeah. Like, my old man wouldn't go out and buy us Some bobbins. bobbins. No yeah. way would he go out and spend a couple of quid on bobbins. Like, we had bottle tops and that was yeah. it. You know? I like, think it's cool, man. And it also, it's, it, it is, in terms of, we're going to talk about the boat and your river fishing and that whole sort of life on the river. But it also means that when something happens, you are resourceful and being able to sort of deal with problems rather mm. than being, in some ways, which a lot of people are, and there's nothing wrong with it because it's just the age we live in, but they're very much sort of at the mercy of if something goes wrong, you're Throw in the away absolute, society. Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah. Do you know, there's no make, do and mend. That used to be the motto. Like after, it's, I sound like an old soul when you, you say You do, don't you? Like old soul and a young, young, but, um, young You think that after the war and that, the motto of the country was make, do and mend. Mm. Do you know what happened to that? What happened to the, oh, that's broke. Yeah. Get a bit of glue on that or, do you know what I mean? Pop rivet it back together or do you know if you could weld it, you'd weld it and, like to be fair, it's quite it's quite amusing because when I sit there and talk, and you think back to like why are you like this, why it's it's probably a big massive subconscious thing. Do you know what I mean? I've probably inherited so much of how the old man brought us up that I, you don't really realise. You know, massive influence. Yeah, yeah. by talking yeah. to you, I mean obviously, yeah, I, I wasn't party to to sort of knowing you properly in that regard before, but you can see it there in the age where you go around every carp fishery. And the appearance of somebody's setup is so heavily oh, sort of mate. On it, you people that kind of read you like a book. Like some people wouldn't talk to you if your rods weren't matching. Do you know what I mean? Because it is a bit like that. Like oh, well, he obviously don't know what he's doing. Look yeah, at his noddy. rods. That's what they say. Noddy, look, he don't know what he's doing. His rods are wonky. Or but that appearance thing is big. I think it's the advent yeah, of social massively. media, isn't it? Yeah. Instagram. You know. The, you, You've spent some time with Elle. You take some great images, some incredible images of setups and yeah. things like that. Oh, and, mate. And it becomes a sort of an image that people want to portray and buy into. Yeah. Whereas you are probably the polar opposite of all that. Oh, massively. Yeah, <laughs> massive. It's not a bit you know, of you, was, is it? We was going in the other day when we was on the phone. None of my rods are matching. Uh, all my, I had a pair of nice tournament 5000s. Um, I had three at the start and I remember getting them and I was thinking mate look at my matching reels these are the bollocks these are but um, one seized up because I used it for lure fishing far too many times <laughs> um, the other one I left on my roof of my car and I drove down the A120 and it come off and went under a lorry so that got snapped into a thousand pieces and I've got one left but it's taped to the rod because I was I was pike fishing um, river up north Otter's taking the dead bait in the middle of the night. No. I obviously didn't know it was an otter. All I've had is the drop off and a wee because it's taking line. Absolute and When I've run up to the road and felt felt the line, obviously it's taken quite quick. And I'm like, fucking hell, that pike's on its way. Shut the bail arm, hit into it. The rod's oh. hooped round. And as I'm like holding back, the reel handle has snapped. <laughs> so now my tournament's just laid on the floor and I'm just holding a rod. Do you know what I mean? And well, you're on braid as well, isn't you? Because you're yeah, dead baiting. Yeah, because you're dead. You've got to have good braid on, do you know what I mean? Because you've got to fish safe. So, like, if I ever get snagged or whatever, mm. at least when you pull for a break, you straighten your hooks. You don't leave a whole yeah. setup out there. Yeah. Like, I like to have my tackle strong enough. I could straighten my hooks and get everything back. Carp That's, fishing and pike in that? Pike fishing more, because I yeah. kind of I use fluoro a lot for carp fishing, so it, you kind of can't really do it with that. Nah. Um, but, yeah, snaps the tournament on an otter. So that was... a do you know, so all of a sudden, I ain't got matching reels anymore. And next thing you know, you're like, Jay, like to my twin brother, Jamie, what reels you got laying about? And he had a few, like yeah. a couple of Dara Regals. Do you remember the Dara Regals? Yes, yeah. <laughs> like, so next thing you know, I've got like one of them on one rod and a Shimano 8000 on the other. That was one of my old man's reels and like the oh, rods I've quality, had. Mate. Yeah, so. It's like going back in time. Yeah, and like you lose bits and bobs and I ain't got the same <laughs> bank sticks and 
I can't remember the last time I had a matching pair of bobbins. I can't remember the last time I had a matching pair of bobbins. Like, it don't really matter, do you know? It's never really mattered to me. No, but it's, it's, again, it's... It, and to be fair, it's probably done me a favour because people walk past go, absolute nod. We ain't going to talk to him. And I get left right alone, you know? Yeah, that's, that's like, handy as well, <laughs> isn't it, mate? And plus I come out and then obviously when they do want to stand, I come out and I've got like holes in my shorts and I've got like a ragged... You put the old housewife I'll, specials I'll on today, special haven't you, mate? shorts on today, yeah. Your short shorts. <laughs> so I always look a bit rough around the edges. I mean, a lot of people, it ain't just what you see on the bank... They'll get out their bivvy and they are head to toe like they've just come out of angling direct. Yeah, didn't yeah, they? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, like like the clothes have never been worn before. But I'm first, first big <laughs> big outing, first big outing, yeah, in yeah, it? Big yeah, night yeah. Out. But I'm I look worn out. That's like my my look and appearance down the fishing lake. Oh, look, mate. Oh, that geezer's been there far too long. Do you know? <laughs> I and like I, this. I won't talk to him. He's a noddy. Yeah, yeah. yeah like, That's an and egg. it's sad that it's like that. Yes. And don't get me wrong, it ain't like I don't assume people to be, everyone assumes and has assumptions if they first meet someone. And sometimes like you walk, talk to someone, you go, fucking hell, they've got some nice gear, I bet they know what they're doing. No idea. And they have no idea. No. You think, mate, like no you've idea. literally just gone 0% finance and fucking. I think it is like, <laughs> it's the cleanliness of it. If they've got good gear, but it's ultra clean. Yeah. You ain't been out. You ain't been catching, have you? Man, you need to fit, see a few nicks and like, Dinks. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? I mean, even my rods, every single one's got a different uh, different rod tip, a uh, different eye. You were telling me you were whipping them on yesterday, yeah, wasn't you? I was fixing all my rods yesterday, yeah. <laughs> cool. Taking cool. off the old ones and putting some new ones on. But... Let's talk fishing. I, said, I referenced there that you you have a boat that spends its time on a local river. We don't yep. need to say where. But you, that means, sort of succinctly, you've spent a lot of time targeting river species and we're going to talk specifically about carp i we haven't talked a great deal about river carp on here i don't think as a podcast as a whole obviously you've done a fair bit in terms of river carping far too far too much for not not as much reward as you'd probably want for the time but intensity of effort heightens any reward as they say oh, he's got some good sayings as well hasn't he yeah. this is just straight out I feel like I'm talking to your old man <laughs> do you know what I mean you've got a it's, wise head on like it's true though is. isn't it do you know the harder you go for something and you finally get it it's the the elation is tenfold compared to done a quick overnight and had one in the morning do you know I'll take a quick overnight mate I know and so <laughs> would I you know when you're sitting there struggling you go oh I could go to a day ticket right yeah, now and yeah, I'll yeah. just get a bend in the rod and it'll be cushy and I ain't got to worry about blanking this whole time there's places for it all, I suppose. Yeah, yeah, of course, of course. River-wise, for you, in terms of river carp fishing, talk to me about, because you mentioned there earlier, and we'll talk for a few chapters of your other fishing on lakes, but the differences when you're looking at a piece of river and going to fish it, as opposed to fishing what majority of people, I'd imagine, fish more regularly, which is lakes, what... What are considerations that you need through through your experience in terms of if you're going to go target some carp on a river? I'd say, I'd say to find out what's in there, but half the time, a lot of people don't know, do they? So you've got to, got to graft and find them at least, you know? No one wants to be sitting on a stretch of river and there might only be a few little ones in there. Or mm. Even though it is exciting to go after the unknown, granted, and that's half the reason to do it. But the unknown is how big they are and how many, do you know what I mean? You've still got to find. How do you suss that then? Because if I look at a river... And, and everyone says the same thing, location, known as stocks and, and all that, and I completely get it. But if I'm rocking up to a river, you can only see, I don't know, what, that part of it, which is a part of a section. 20 yards of a mile yeah, stretch. You can't mile see, stretch, like a lake you know? where you no, might see no, one no, nut no. out 200 yards away. How do you gauge that population-wise, what's in there? Um, right, let's say I'm going up to a, let's say I've turned up to a river and I've never been there before. Well, I'm going to start at the weir pool. Do you know what I mean? Because usually there's a few brick walls about or something you can stand on and get a better mm. better view. And usually at the weir pool, you can kind of see down the river to an, a certain extent, you know, see where all the big trees are hanging in. But a lot of it, you've just got to walk. You've just got to walk it and either see a few bubbles somewhere. It is kind of a bit like lake fishing. It's the only gra- more hard graft is, is your visibility. Like you said, you, yeah. can, you ain't got... 20 acres of water in front of you to be like, oh, there was one over the far side. You've just got to be up and down, up and down. And so, like, a boat is a massive difference. Yeah. Not like, not obviously my big boat, 
you know, your little blow up boat, what you can get from Argos for 30 quid or whatever, just anything to get you in the water. Because as soon as you're in the water and you've got your specs on, yeah, different ball game. It's a different ball game because you can get up and down. You start at the top of the stretch, you get in your little rubber dinghy, you can float down to the bottom. Do you know what I mean? You don't even need to pair of always with you. You kind of just go with the go with the flow, and you you sneak in, and you can see things on your way. You know, um, so that plays a massive part. You just got to get in your boat. It's graft. It's yeah. just graft. You just got to. But you there. wouldn't you wouldn't fish it. You wouldn't apply bait or anything like that without getting a gauge somehow, whether that be via a boat. I, I wouldn't put no bait like in until nothing. you kind of see something that not see a car, but even a feature. You know. I mean, there's no point getting to a river and chucking out five kilo bait and then realise you've just put it in a load of cabbages. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, fair enough. The carpet can get there and smash your bait, but where's your rig going? Yeah, you ain't. <laughs> you ain't do you know what I mean? Yeah. So, um, you know, what I mean, you might get a third mile down the river, see a nice bend, all of a sudden there's a big old clear spot on the bottom or something that looks like there's been action, or like you might see another angler set up on the bank and see, all oh, right, well, some of like summer fish is there. Must be an all right bit. So it's kind of, it's hit and miss a lot. Because sometimes it's, you don't know. Sometimes it's a part of the river where there's no footpaths either side or it's all houses or, yeah, and it's tough. And I, I think, I don't think it's saying that you can go and suss out in a day. No. Or two, do no. you know? As soon as you think about river fishing, it's like, right, this is going to be a bit of a, what do you call it? A campaign. Yeah, you need the yeah. time, don't you? Yeah, until you know the river well enough, then you can just plod on for the night here and there and do whatever you want because you kind of you're a part of it. Then areas for you, like places to to sort of target or generally where you found carp, are they distributed anywhere through the stretch, or are they normally around slower, slacker water features? I think it's quite seasonal, is I, it? Uh, and I've only really sussed it out last year or two. Um, not just by my own fishing, but obviously. Let's say the river I fish has a little Facebook page or something. Do you know what I mean? You always get the odd like person yeah. throw something up. But when you start connecting the dots, you go, oh, that happened last year. You think, oh, my God, they were there again this year. Like, for example, when it a part of the river I fish, when it was in flood, going back to the Weirpool, it must be slack of current up the back of the Weirpool, whatever. But someone who, who I know is fishing it absolutely hold it in like massive flood water. Like, I went down and was like, nope. No thanks. <laughs> no yeah. thanks. I'm not going to fish there. But, mate, you did. And fucking hell, he had like six or seven up to like 32 pounds. Wow. Yeah, out of a weir pool, which is probably 25 foot deep, and he's fishing under his rods, like under Jeez. his tip. And you think, mate, I'd have never done that. I'd have never in my life done that. But then the following year, someone else does it, and they got the same result. And you think, oh, my God. That's where they go in flood. And then back to years previous, and that were, like I said, connecting the dots, back to years previous when it was a massive flood, I've gone for a walk down another stretch. And obviously most rivers have got like a, a weir pool, yep. but they've got a back channel as well, haven't they? So the back yep. channel comes back and meets it on the river. Obviously when the mill used to be there, because obviously most weirs were there because it used to have a mill and the mill would collect the water and obviously flush it back around onto the river. So then back channels... A couple of years ago, I'm walking up a back channel and I found, it was a big, big linear, I probably aren't know, 27, 28 pounds, but it was dragged up on the bank by not us, so the scales were everywhere and that. Oh. But it was like the furthest away up the back channel as you could get. Do you know what I mean? As right. far back yeah, yeah, yeah. up the slack water as you could possibly think. Like To even get there took half hour walking through like massive fields and through bits of wood and trees. The, yeah, it's unbelievable how the carp get up there, but that's where they was. And like, Obviously, I fought back to that. So that's like three occasions I know of like, where I think it's been flood water. Mm. They've been up the back channels. Do you know? And then back to like when I'm, I, I love my pike fishing. And you start realising like the pike do it as well. Do they do they follow similar patterns, those two species? Um, I think it's more just like the environment. Maybe it's because it's the river. Yeah. It's more, to, it's probably a lot to do with the current. Yeah. yeah oxygenated cool. water. Yeah. Things like that. But then I started, obviously you read your books and then you start realising that the pike kind of get up them back channels as well. And then in a really bad flood, the silvers get up there. Mm. So, I mean, sometimes you go up them back channels and you swipe a six foot net through the water, you won't be able to lift your net up out of the water because there's been that many silvers. So you start to think, oh, blimey, maybe most species kind of hide and do that sort of thing. Yeah. 
But yeah, it took years to kind of understand that because otherwise you'd be like in the middle of a flooded torrent river <laughs> two miles down and you ain't got a bean in, fra- uh, in yeah, front of exactly. you. Yeah, exactly. So that's what I mean about it. It's a lot of graft, a lot of... Ghost carp fishing, mate. Yeah, nothing man, there, mate. nothing there at all. You're just getting wiped out by a reed every five, ten minutes, isn't you? Or a big tree coming down or... So, yeah, it's... But that's a different skill set, isn't it? Because you don't get on a lake that massive change in one day. All right, it might flood or whatever, but you're not getting the changes in flow that you get on a river. You're not getting that that literally so, so frequent variation in conditions. No. A lake is a lake, right? And it doesn't change. You know what I mean? They might gather at some point pre-spawning. You know where that is because you fished it. But you can drop onto a lake. You've got a great view. It's pretty sound fishing. You find a spot, hopefully you're on them, you catch them. Yeah. In a river, like, there's so many different considerations. There's no oh, to work out to, that formula, oh, mate, to work out, on. like, let's say it's a big board of cogs, and, like, each, you've got to turn each cog to make sure it works, do you know what I mean, to get the right frequency. In a river, it's like, one day you might have turned them all and be like, oh, sweet, I found them. Next day, it's like, oh, what? It starts starting all over again. Yeah, exactly. And, um... I've got, I've done the pre-baiting, like, I've, I've done pretty well on pre-baiting at times, but then other times, it has died a death. And you think, I've been here every other day for, like, three weeks, putting five kilos or whatever, because you know you're going to get done by the bream and chub and that as well. And they've never turned up. And I thought, oh, I'll do it in the middle of the river. So if any are coming up and down, there's no way they can't see where it is. And you still don't catch. Do you know what I mean? So do they just spend months of their lives in one particular bit, then move, but what makes them move? Like, there's so much to think about why they would move from here to there and do what they're doing, or is that why is there one by itself and there's twenty up there? You know, it's it is a complete head fuck at times. So you really do, from what I can get gathered, there's sort of learning it, and as you say, seeing patterns, seeing where things are caught, sussing it out, pre baiting. We'll talk about all that, but you've also got the other, and this is the only probably bit of river fishing that I've done, which is very reactive. And that is going to a river with stalking gear, a bread bomb, whatever it may be, and seeing them and tangibly fishing for that fish in that place. Because you know full well, A, you've got limited time. You're not going to revisit there. But also opportunities, like you say, that cog, you might see it there, but that might be the only time it's there. How many times have you gone back to the motor to get a bit of bread and it ain't there when you get back? And you think, oh my God, like you can see the bottom. And you've literally just walked back up the where river, so you, you know gone? it ain't gone that way. Yeah, where have you gone? Where have you gone? I mean, the amount of times I've gone up a river in my dinghy, and I've gone, <laughs> there's six carp there, and you come back down the river, and you only see two carp, but them two carp you see ain't the same out of the six you just seen. You think, so where the fuck have the others gone? Yeah. And you can see everything. You can see down to like where someone's put a bit of sweet corn where they've been float fishing that day. Do you know what I mean? You can see absolutely everything once you're in that boat, and it's a nice sunny day. You can go, how have they? How can they just hide like that? Like they laid on the bottom under a cabbage or something. Yeah, to, you know to, to they buried themselves in a yeah. bit of silt somewhere. Like, honestly, it, sometimes you are. The thing is with river fishing, I think a lot of the times you can easily be defeated. And as much as you think you might have something going, it can change like that. Like as quick as you think that you've sussed it, you ain't. And I think that's very exciting in that sort of way. That and the unknown. Yeah. Like you said there a couple of mega things. You said somebody caught a thirty pounder from River, mate. Anything over twenty pound from oh River my God, is incredible. It is, oh, like, yeah, that, a thirty off, pounder yeah. is just ridiculous. Yeah. It's unbelievable, isn't it? I'll never forget seeing that Nick Elliott film from Sticky when he caught up the, the big fifty. End. Oh my God! <laughs> oh my God! And you can't remember you that come from a lake somewhere, miles away. Miles. Exactly. How many locks has that smashed its head over? Do you know what I mean? How many otters has it di- uh, dodged? Stories, in it? Yeah. And you just How don't many know. times has it been lost by the match angler on a four pound line? <laughs> Do you know, you like them sort of things. You'll never know the true, yeah. the true story of River Cup. I, I mean, get the buzz. I really do get the buzz. I speak to Al about it. I speak to Henry. I speak to the boys who've done a fair bit, sort of locally yeah. on the same river that you do, and and I completely get the buzz. But at the same time, and you said it there before, I get the the ag compared to maybe lake fishing where it's stinging it's nettles easier. and mosquitoes. <laughs> whole summer do you know like who's and you like sitting there in no top you like sitting there in a pair of shorts catching the town 
but you don't like being stung to smithereens trying to get a rod out and then being eaten by, by mosquitoes alive. Do you know what I mean? It drives you insane down the river, doesn't it? It's, it's like a different, it's like being in the Amazon somewhere. What about river life, mate? What's, uh, what's life on the boat like in terms of other river users and stuff? You must have seen some absolute sights. It's not too bad, actually. Obviously, you get the absolute weirdos down there. The footpath is full of some amazing people, isn't it? Like, the public footpaths in this country, you get some right characters. What you are? Um, just random. I don't know. Sir, I don't know on the top of my head. Like, you'd get... I don't know. I've seen, like, people going fishing for the day, but there'll be, like, 12 of them on a dinghy. And you think how is that? How is that not taking on water? Do you know? Uh, um, no nutters like talking to themselves or like oh loads of pissheads because on our yeah. bit there's a couple of pubs literally at the end of the thing. So you get the stumblers late at night and the ones standing at the edge of their jetty like all trying to go for a piece and that. And I'll tell you one time actually, um, I don't think the geezer basically this geezer was going for a piss he had to put his trousers down to his ankles and he's standing on the edge of the jetty going yeah. for a piss Top but work. he's doing it right in front of a canal boat his family lives on no. and the, the the woman of the canal boat is at the back of the boat so this woman has automatically assumed that this geezer's like foul playing like looking at her with his old Corey in his hand and that like and now next thing she's gone and got the old man so the old man's gone oh mate what do you think you're doing and the next thing you know, he's kind of run off. So now he looks suspect, yeah. doesn't he? Now he looks like he was being a bit weird. Don't but, he's o- but he's only ended up running onto the side where they was. So he's like, obviously run around the river. Oh. But like some of us go, oh, he might have been coming to say sorry. But the next thing you know, like he's outside their boat. And then like, oh, it's just all gone off. Then he's like jumped in the nettles and he tried getting away because he's been chased and... Next thing you know, it's like, there's a nonce down the river, like, and it's all that sort of crazy thing. <laughs> or you get people, like, fighting, or yeah. amount of times I've had my mate, like, my mates wake up in the morning and their neck's gone. And, like, oh, unhooking really? mats has been gone and that. Or you get nasty people as well. Do you know what I mean? Sat there yeah. asleep at night, and obviously my, my, my bed chair is on the footpath, and you've got your little brolly on top of you. So maybe you're taking up a bit too much room. But it's in the middle of the night. You don't really expect anyone to come round. You, you're gone early in the morning anyway. But I've had people come past on push bikes and completely wipe out my bivvy. You know, like you've got your storm poles and they're just resting on the pavement. Like you can't dig them in, can you? No. But when they ride past and they kick both your storm poles out, so you like, you probably just fall on top of you. And the last thing you do is jump up and start arguing. So you just lay there and go, oh, for fuck's sake. Like, and it's happened again. I've had that quite a few times. Or like you get someone whinge and go, oh, you shouldn't be here, rah, rah, rah. And the dogs like run through your line and that. And then, yeah, dogs. Oh, man. My little Doris ain't like that. She's quite good around Trained, fishing rods. Man, yeah, she's very, very good, well trained. Man, she? But you just get weirdos, you know. Or you get the people who live on the boat and they're like, oh, yeah, I've had everything out of here. Do you get that? Oh, get that all track? the time. All the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, the, pho- oh, the old phone comes out with photos. Yeah, and, all and they're that. holding the fish super far out. And they're like, <laughs> oh, I've had this. And... <laughs> Someone showed me the other day, uh, somebody lives on one of the canal boats. Uh, as you do, you walk past, you say hello, fancy cup of tea. You're like, oh, yeah, go on then. And he's passed me the cup. And when I've looked at it, he's a picture of his mate holding a cup. He went, you had this one? And he goes, £42 pound this, out of the river. He went, March the 18th. And I was like, nice. No. He went, yeah, three days after the season finished. He went, we sneaked it out. And I'm like, you dirty <laughs> yeah. dog. Do you, you know what I mean? But you get people like that. And he yeah. was like, yeah, caught it on my six foot sawn off and a bit of bread. Do you think, yeah, fair play. And don't get it wrong, it was like an upper 30 weather. That's ridiculous. But like, do you know, all of a sudden then the sling gets weighed. Do you know what I mean? That don't get taken yeah. off. There's an extra three pound there. Then it's like... That's good angling. Yeah, do you know? <laughs> um, and you get them all the time. All the time. Or, oh, it's the ones they lost that are even bigger. Yeah. Do you know the people losing down the river? It's all of a sudden they're fucking massive, isn't they? Lost a big one. <laughs> lost mate. a big one the other day. You never lose a <laughs> You never lose a bat, do you? Do you? Cricket cricket bat. Bat. You never lose one of them. Like good old colds on the old cricket bats, mate. But I feel a lot of characters. and Yeah. Probably because the pub's there. It's a bit worse with the piss heads and things like that. Well, that's entertainment, isn't it? Yeah, Keep it is. going. You talked, feel- you talked earlier about pre-baiting, mate. Now... Again, I'm trying to transfer this for somebody who might want to go and do a bit of river fishing. Where, like, you've seen some fish, you know they're in the stretch. 
pre-baiting, you've found some likely looking areas where you can fish. In terms of pre-baiting, you talked about other species, obviously bream, tench, catfish, who knows what's in the river systems. It could be anything. How would you go about pre-baiting? With re- do you pre-bait in relation to what you've seen in terms of population of carp, or do you have just a, like a blanket starting point for it all? How does that work? I know that there's going to be a lot of silver fish on it, and I know there's going to be a lot of chub and bream because that's the majority of the species in a river, in it? Usually yeah. your carp. I mean, some of the stretches I fish, there's probably 30, 40 carp sometimes. Okay, so there's a few. So sometimes, like, but then the stretch down, I might only have 12. Do you know? And it's weird. Like, Let's say these two stretches in particular, we call one the church stretch and one the sailing stretch, yeah? Well, the church stretch had about 40 carp in there, 30, 40 carp. All of them commons. Never right. see a mirror. How weird is that? But then, coincidentally, the the lake next door to the river is known for its commons. All commons Only yeah. got two mirrors in the whole lake. So, like, these commons have obviously come from there, gone in. But then the sailing stretch down there, that's got a lake next to it. They're um, all mirrors. <laughs> and a lot of them are mirrors. Yeah, yeah, so okay. it's unbelievable how, like, yeah, different... Yeah, segregated. The, yeah, and then... Don't get it wrong, you'll catch a few Simos out of their mirrors. Like, yeah, yeah, some yeah. of them are a bit pale and simo y do you know what <laughs> I mean? Like, not really big, fat ones, but... And then the commons, a lot of them are cricket bats. So you... And you were talking probably, I don't know, let's say them two stretches together are like four miles long. So them four miles, you've got a lot of fish to go for, really. Yeah. Um, But that, that church stretch, yeah, I did give them a lot of food, man. Five key every other day. And a lot just of boil- boily? Uh no, a lot of nuts and that as well. Okay. Do you know things like that? I think the nuts kind of help because a lot of less fish will eat them. The brain mate's so keen on the nuts and things like that. And you kind of do want to leave a bit of grab for them. But I I'd, I'd used to put out a couple of kilos of sweet corn like once a week as well just to get a bit of colour down there. And you want to get the bottom wiped clean, didn't you, really? That's the thing with pre baiting. It's not so much a lot to do with it is to get the carp there and get them learnt and taught that there is going to be food there for when you turn up. Mm. You need something good to fish on as well, and I think that's what really helps with all like your grains, your seeds, your, your corns, all that sort of stuff. Really gets you a spot that you can fish effectively. Do you know? Because you a lot of the time on rivers, you'll get a hell of a donk if you can't see the bottom. You get a crack, you go banging, sweet. That's a crack. Sweet, yeah. I'm fishing, but you don't know that it's six foot long eel grass or like. Um, like weeds, you know, like the stream of weed and things yeah, like that. Yeah, yeah. And you can fall straight through that. It's only in the morning when you pick it up that you notice you've got another six foot bit of green on the end and you ain't been fishing. So like a pre-baiting does play an awful big part of getting your, your spot prepped, ready for your arrival. You're creating a dinner plate, basically. You create a dinner yeah. plate massively. And yeah. it, you see the same on fishing lakes and things like that when you go out in a boat and you'll have that dinner, that dinner plate sized spot that's polished. And you can like you can get them on rivers, you know. You can make them, you can man make them yourself on rivers, you know. Start off with a weed rake. I've always done quite well starting off with weed rake and getting as much off as I can. Then applying the food. Where would you apply that? Do you, does it matter to you? Do you think do you, you said mid flow before, like just putting it in the middle of the river so that wherever yeah, they so, intersect it, they might see it. But would would you prioritise that over maybe I don't know, like a slack a little eddy or something? Quite a lot of time, because like you said earlier. I, about the opportunist thing, I yeah. do a lot of opportunist fishing down the river because it's some, sometimes I don't want to campaign. It's a lot more enjoyable. But if I am right campaign, this is how it's going to go and you kind of get your teeth sunk in. Usually I'll do two spots. I'll do like one mid river that I, I've always been under the impression that they don't stop moving, which mm-hmm. ain't the case. They do hold up and they, you won't see them for weeks. But given that they are still in the river and or not, I might spook them off one spot and they have got to move or fishermen might land on their head and they've got to move again. So the, the middle river one's always a, a pretty half decent shout. Yeah. And then your second spot is where I've, I know you can't always find them and I know that, but that's why you have your middle river spot because at least you've got the wandering spot. That's the wanderer, isn't it? Anything that's wandering, that's going to find that. And then You fall back on that. And yeah, you, yeah. yeah, fall back spot. Um, let's say you can find them then you keep a bit of bait going in there as well, you know, okay. and just get them confident because they'll eat, man. Like carp in the river, they eat. It's quite astonishing how much they can go for as well, you know. It's just, it's a harder life, isn't it? Yeah. They're having to move a hard, lot more, hard, isn't hard, they? Yeah. Fight against the flow. There's 
all sorts going on. There's potential predation. There's, there's. Do you know what I mean? It, it, it's changeable conditions. It Everything. must be a harder life for a carp. Yeah, yeah, definitely. 100%. And what like was going on about earlier? Um, with sometimes you can't get it right, and the the, the dials turn every day. Mm. Having two spots, it's like multiple chances. Then you ain't got all your eggs in one basket. Like if you do it, if you do do a spot and it's down the bottom or at the top, and they don't want to be there. You've just wasted a whole lot of money on food, uh, on carp food. Yeah. A whole lot of money on fuel and that getting there. All the hours and that you ain't spending at home. Do you know what I mean? Getting moaned at by your missus because you're supposed to be at home, but you're down the river frying in boilies. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? It's a lot of graft yeah. that goes in. Yeah. Like my last campaign, and I was putting a bit of bait in, I, when, when I timed myself, it took me 28 minutes to walk to my spot and back to the car. And you'd have a five kilo bucket with you, and that was every other day two or three weeks so you add it up that's a lot of money on bait a lot of time and a lot of walking and when I finally come to do it um, I've ended up taking my boat up there and putting my boat like 50 yards up from my spot and walking my rods down do you know what I mean having on the receiver and that all I caught was chub <laughs> all I caught was chub didn't yeah. see a single carp do you know and it like really it's another lesson learned you know that's all Another. part of it, like you said before. Is you, the rewards after all that are so much greater, in they? Because yeah, yeah, a of bit course. Of a, a bit of a, a lot of time, time. you can. Yeah, I don't think it's for the faint-hearted carp fishing on rivers, because a lot of people want reward for their efforts, mm. and a lot of people I don't think can hack if you don't get what you want at the end of it. I mean, so this autumn, for example, I done that big bait up on the river, and that was going to be for my my filming for SIP. Yeah. So obviously it's like my river, my autumn river fishing. You want to catch something, do you know? Yeah, I've just been graft. I've got myself filming, walking up the river, doing all that, do you know? So you're trying to build like a story. Um, and it gets to the time where you think, right, now it's just time to go and fish your pre bait spot and all I've caught is chub and bream. Mm. And it's like, I didn't catch anything after that, after the autumn. It was yeah. like a real struggle and I tried hard. But my friend Tom, we went out on my boat, went upstream to a different stretch and he's found one carp by itself. And he's like, right, we fish here tonight. And I'm like, man, there's only one. Like, let's go and find the others. And we went and carried a look and couldn't find any others, which is so annoying. So he's like, well, we're just going to have to go and fish for that one then. Lo and behold, he had it that morning. It was only about oh. £80. Pound, lovely looking common. But that that was it. After that, I, I didn't catch nothing. So like, you do it. I've done a whole autumn. A lot of bait, a lot of time, a lot of walking. Man, petrol on in the boat. It's graft. It's and I didn't catch nothing, absolutely nothing. Like it's, uh, yeah. no carp. My my friend had one for the efforts, and that was kind of a team effort. Um, well, I'm gonna nick half the capture of him anyway. Do you know what yeah, I mean? Take it was, that. It take was on my boat. Time. Yeah. <laughs> but I think that, that that's part of it, though, isn't it? I yeah. Think when you do that type of, and we talked about the the other type of river fishing, which is basically when conditions allow, going and seeing them, free lining, bread bombing, and and being that reactive side. That's completely different. Anybody could rock. Anybody, and do that. any, yeah, it's can be, yeah. But the campaign stuff, you've got to have, you've got to have effort and your head and knowledge. To, you've got to know. Exactly. You know, you can't just. I've done it so many times. You turn up somewhere in the dark and you whop your rods out. Mm. And how many times have I caught? Not that many, you know. What about rigs, bait? Where, what, what, what are the sort of differences, considerations when you're tackling up to fish those rivers as opposed to if you were going to linear or a day ticket complex, mate? Um, line lay. I always used to think that line lay had a lot to do with. Rivers, do you know what I mean? I didn't want my line coming through my spot and because you think on the river, it's going right to left, left to right, or whatever, but there's always a good current. Mm. So you hit your lead in the water and then you follow the current with it. You think, do I fish a tight line? Yeah. Or do you fish a slack line, let it bow round? Like, and it's only fishing a little tidal section and you literally just use the cast out, let like six foot of line off and just put your rods on the railings. And it would like, and you'd catch, and I caught a lot of carp doing it just like that. And I started to think, maybe they don't care about line lay. And then I started doing it on the river, and you just, you know, cast out, let it drop, let three or four foot line off, so it's got a bow in it. Yeah, sit it on the thing. Obviously, you've got a heavy enough lead that you ain't going to be pulled off bottom anyway. And man, like, I, I stopped worrying about it. And the minute I stopped worrying about line lay in the river, it's one less thing to worry about, and it's one more thing that you can gain confidence on. I think a confident angler catches more, didn't they? Yeah. 
So, um, so you don't think they're first at all about lying? No, nah, see, lying, lying things. Like, I don't think it matters. Like my mate Tommy, we had that the common that autumn. He was bang on lying late. Oh, I'm going to fish from the other side of the river. <laughs> right, right, right. So, you know, I'm going to get round to the other side. I'm going to do it like this. Oh, I'm fishing over a lily bed, or like, do you know the cabbages? I'm yeah. fishing in a hole in between. The ca- and he was like, "What should I do with my line? Should I back line it up there?" Do you know, backled it here, and I, he was thinking, so I'm going to backled it from here, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. And I'm like, mate, whop the rod out, yeah, <laughs> stick it on the bobbin, yeah. and sit down. Yeah. <laughs> like, don't worry. And he was like, really? I was like, mate, it's just like another thing to absolutely fry your brain over, isn't it? Um, my rigs don't really change. I don't know, sometimes I'll go like a foot long or whatever. I was going to say, length of the hook length, generally? Yeah, see like... Depending on what river, I suppose. So, like, if you if you was going to go somewhere as fast as flowing, mm. some of the river lees on its way, do you know what I mean? You can get a good flow on some of that. And you've got to lengthen your rigs a bit more. Yeah. Just because some fish are a bit, like, lead shy and that, do you know? Or they they do know they're being fished for, so you kind of want to be away from all that. But the, the river where my boat is, it's only slow moving. Right. Do you know? It's very slow. So a nice, calm... Hey, so you ain't you ain't got to worry about everything being too confined and so a standard carp rig half the time, you know, your standard eight to ten inch carp rig is more than suffice to do it, you know, it's perfect. Um always like a big hook on a river. I don't know why. I don't know why. My mate my mate would like he don't he'll fish size eights and tens and that and he'll catch just as many carp, but I think oh, I can't put an eight or a ten on. I can't I, can't I don't know why. I'm like I'm Size fours all the way, you know. You get a big, a good one, and I like. I don't know why I like a decent sized bait. My first ever river cart. I'll take you back to the first ever river cart I caught. Um, that was on. That was when four G squid first come out. Yeah, that's when that first come out, and it was three fifteen mil four G squid. Three of them. Three of them together. Ooh. Yeah, with a fake bit of floating maze on top. <laughs> Absolutely no bear in that floating bit of maze. No, it didn't. Of course it didn't. Of course it didn't. But you imagine how long that thing was. It looked like a stick of pepperami with a bit of sweet corn on the end. You know what I mean? Um, had it. Caught one. My first ever one was tw- £27.8. My first car. Your had, first river My first river was £27.8. Was £27. £27. Yeah. That's um, how. That I know. I couldn't, believe it, honestly, like yeah, couldn't believe it. Honestly. Um, yeah. I couldn't believe it. And that was seven days straight we done. That was like my first ever river fishing experience for the carp you know my mate who I was with he was just a dodgy mate I used to have I think the car we was driving about in didn't have no MT tax or insurance <laughs> and we was just like little river pirates like but all the back lanes on the river the, the river was fishing only about 10 miles to fishable bit you know right. what the carp were in yeah 10 miles probably six locks or seven locks and the back lanes were like little veins you know each back lane leaded to another bit so you could get out of one back lane across a little green lane and use back yeah. onto another. And we chased them for seven days. And it was June, we started June the 16th. We'd done the June 15th night. Yeah. Um, he had a tent at about 10 past 12. And then after that, we didn't catch nothing for seven days. And it was like 30 degree heat. Oh. Stinging it all. mosquitoes died. Yeah, like I said, it was horrible. You're sunburned. You're covered in mud. Um. And all I was catching is like, I had a really big chub actually. And I remember waking my mate up holding it and like kicking his bed chair. <laughs> so he didn't want to get out. So I'm, he's sitting, he's laying like down in his bed chair, holding, holding his phone. Yeah, and I'm like that. this in the front of his bed, in front of his bibby, holding his big old chubby and it's covered in mud because I've had to walk through reeds to get it. That's stuff. proper, mate. Oh, that. carnage. <laughs> but that was a big pre-baiting sesh. Um, and I'll tell you what, actually, the most amazing thing about that is there was a bridge. We call it the 1951 bridge. It just says it on the side of the bridge. It must be you. It was made away with a big white bridge. Lovely thing it is. And uh, we started on this stretch, like I said, we're six days in by now. And we're walking down the river and I see this like white flash in the in the, in the the river and it's like moving downstream. And I, I knew it was something to do with a fish because, do you know, it, it was, was mid-water, moving. just the way it was moving. Yeah. And when we got up to the bridge and stood on the top of 1951 bridge, all of a sudden there's about 10 carp there. And the white thing I see was a scar, a healing scar on the wrist oh. of this mirror. that, I, And we thought the mirror to be 30 pound. And it had a common with it, what we called white lips, because all we could see is these perfect white lips. And we was like, that's a 35 pound all day long. Like it, There was some decent fish here, but this was all around spawning time. Right. Um, 
And I I remember chucking a bit of white bread in front of that white lips and it literally went went up to it and looked at it and went, ha, you reckon, do you? Oh, <laughs> I kind no. of just swam up. But anyway, we done that night there uh, on the white bridge and we stood on top of the white bridge and we was throwing in all this bait. There was a big like gravel bar. On the bridge, there was a gravel bar and then it dropped off to about 12 foot the other side of the bridge. Wow, 12 foot? So you got yeah, a bit mate, of depth. Though, honestly, yeah. it, was only, it was probably from about six foot to about 12 foot and it dropped under a bridge. So it was just a big hump and it went straight down. Oh, just hit the microphone. Like the mic. <laughs> yeah, straight down like the mic. Um, and my mate, he wanted to fish the shallow bit because this is where we see him, the six foot bit. And I was like, all right, I'll fish in the deeps. And that night, um, we didn't catch nothing. And we was a bit disheartened because they were close, you know. Mm. We went home. So we'd done our seven days and now it's like, oh, we didn't catch nothing. And when we went home, I rang him back up. I was like, I'm going back down there. Same like, spot. I, same spot. I said, I'm going back down there. Do you know It's the closest we got to carp for the whole week. Other than one other time uh, where I caught that chub in the mud, that's where we found, when I was going on about that church stretch, um, that's where we see all the commons, about 30 or 40 oh, commons. Okay, yeah, yeah. And it's because they were spawning. It was all on this big tree and they all smashing about and that. But anyway, yeah, so we're back at this bit at the bridge, 1951 bridge, and we're defeated. You know, we've gone home, sunburned and that, got ourselves creamed back up, like, got us a bit hydrated. I said, I'm going back down there. I was like, what are you doing? My mate was like, yeah, I'll meet you down there. And they were still there, hanging about the same sort of bit. So my my friend Hayden, he's he's put his, he was fishing Urban Bait Snutcracker, and he had two of them together, two yeah. 15 millers joint together. And he's underarmed it. I'm standing on the bridge and he's on the bank. And when he's underarmed it onto the onto the bar, the bar yeah. I'm telling him where it's going. And I'm like, now nah, wind it in a bit more to the left and it's gone. I'm like, bang, mate, you are bang in the middle of this. I went, come and put some bait in. I was like, and I've pointed to where his baits were. You could see it was clear as day. And he's putting like maple peas out there, boily, sweet corn, tiger nuts. And he is like carpeted the whole of this bar. As we're doing it, two carp have come in and started Pac-Manning. No. And I'm like, oh my God, man. And they're picking up boilies coming up mid wall, spitting them out and stuff. <laughs> Going back down and picking the same boilie up. <laughs> oh, I was like, oh my God, like tonight. Yeah, it's happening. Tonight is the night. Like, oh my God, here we go. <laughs> So we're going like, obviously you have a few drinks, have a smoking and we're sitting there, we're buzzing. We're thinking, mate, any minute now this is going off, the darkness comes and you're sitting there. And it was quiet all the way through the night. Uh, it's June, Obviously it's June time. It's June the 22nd by right? June 23rd now, like yeah, week yeah. after season. Like I said, just blanks the whole week after the season's opened. Get woken up about half four in the morning to two, um, two like lure anglers middle of summer do you know two eastern europeans middle of summer and they're coming past one of them's kicked my rod off the rest no yeah so i've had a did it -did, and i've looked and my rod sat like come off the back crest it's just sat on the alarm and i've like kind of as you do you kind of give them a dodgy look as you walk past you think you little mug do you know what i mean let's pick my rod back up and put it where you found it and uh so i've got up put that back down i've laid back down 15 minutes later it's gone did and I thought, oh, it's just a lion settling or Saints caught it. See, I've just picked it up and moved it, you know. And over 10 minutes later, it's gone, did, did, wee! And I'm like, oh my God. And this is on the triple, the triple 15 mil 4 Gs and a bit of maze, yeah? <laughs> fighting it. My mate's heard the bite, so he's come down and I'm fighting it. Um, and as I'm getting it to the net, obviously I've seen it's come up and it's a mirror and it's the one with the scar. Ooh. It's the one with the white scar on its tail. So it's we're like 30, pounder. 30 pounder. Here we go. Do you know? Um, obviously, you, as you do, my first ever river car, I dropped the rod, man. You're like, oh my God. And you hug your mate and you're all jumping about like a pig and shit. Isn't you? <laughs> and uh, as we've got in the net, obviously a couple of minutes later, you've all calmed down. And I've gone, man, there was carp feeding on your spot last night, Hades. How come you ain't had nothing? Oh, so you in the deeps? Yeah, I was in the deeps, oh, in the 12-foot okay, so okay, deeps. Yeah, you know, yeah. I'm right in the deeps. So I'm off the bottom of the shelf. I'm like in the darkness. I couldn't even see if there was a carp there. And he's still up on that bar. And he's still up on this shelf yeah. where you can see his two boilies and it looked pucker. He's the one who had the carp on him the night yeah. before. We've gone up onto the bridge and we've gone, what the fuck? And honestly, bruv, there was not a grain of hemp left on this bar. The only thing you could no, see no, is two 15 mil nutcrackers glued together with a curf shank on the side of it. I kid you not. He was white. Uh, he was wiped How? out completely. There was not a. Every stone was on like overturned. 
Like, They've definitely been in a carp's mouth, mate. <laughs> mate, he got annihilated. And I've, I've looked at him <laughs> and we've just like gone, how have you just been blanked? Like, it was, yeah, it was like, uh, how so many? You put a bit in as well. You said you put a lot in, didn't Man, you? Man, bucket. Like a, a proper bucket no. full of grub, mate. We've obviously found a dozen carp. We've seen two potential 30s and a load of other good ones. We're like, mate, they're on the munch. And this is the week after they've just done their spawning. <laughs> the like, like you, you'd like to think they're on it now. And they was on it. Mate, if and that it, was my spot, I'd just jump ahead and off the bridge. Honestly, mate. I couldn't believe it. He ended up staying another two nights and still didn't right. catch nothing. Yeah, it was like, this is what I mean about the head fight. We found them. I even caught one and they were still there and he still didn't catch them. Like, that's how much of a, a nightmare the rivers can be. Do you know? That is. <laughs> like, you're next to him and you fed him. And, like, yeah, oh, it's unbelievable. Oh, mate. That's but what a fish. Yeah, I couldn't believe 27 it. Yeah. 20, pa- that's 27 pounds eight. And um, I've never seen it again since. Never seen anyone else have a picture of it. Or, cause obviously mirror, it, like scar on it, you said. Mirror. It was, it was, a, it was a, very, a very bland mirror. And it had a few really nice scales on its shoulders. Mm. It was like, identical either side. But on one side, it was like a triangle scar on its on the wrist of its tail. It's almost like someone's grabbed it and like tore the skin off. Right. Wow. I don't know if it was like a, a knot has like grabbed the bit with its teeth and then the skin's teared. Or, but it was quite fresh. And obviously that was the telltale. That was the telltale fish giveaway. Yeah. The giveaway because we followed them fish from like a mile up, and it was only by the time we got to the bridge a mile down, and we stood on the bridge that we kind of. You can now peer down into the water and see what was there. But before, you're just following yeah. this weird. What? It's good, though. Like, if you get a cheeky rogue koi, mate, they often give them the away. The giveaway fish, they? man. Yeah, yeah pucker, pucker. But, oh, um, good. Oh, it was just unbelievable. And that kind of really, in that week, not only did I learn every single back road and lane and nook and cranny to the <laughs> river, it kind of it kind of cemented me as a, that was now what, that was my belonging almost, yeah. you know. My old man already give me, like, it's the same river my dad taught me how to fish, you know. Um, yeah, nice. It's the same river my old man fished in the 60s, you know. Like, God bless him. My old man's ashes even went down that river, you know. So it's bless. like a, it's got a lot Spiritual of... Spiritual aim, isn't it? Yeah, so it's a very special... And, it, yeah, when I look back to it now, and even saying it like that, when I think about it, yeah, it was always, always my my calling, so to speak, to to be that way inclined with the with the river fishing, you know. Without even knowing it. Like that is how it was always going to end up. I, I, I suppose I was destined destined to be a bit more yeah. wild with the the river things and stuff like that. And I suppose what the rivers have taught me, like you do have you you've got to use your initiative and find out certain ways or do things or always be prepared that your plans might not work and you know just be very open minded with the whole. Yeah. And I think I do take a lot of that attitude to the lakes when I when I do go fish lake. Like, don't get it wrong. I love my lake fishing. It ain't mm. like I live on the river. Mm. I, I really enjoy my lake fishing. They're just maybe not so much the the lakes of the norm. But I, st- I still take that same... Mentality. Menta- yeah, definitely, yeah, yeah. definitely. Like, yeah, river fishermen gone lake. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, I like that. It's yeah. not really the other way around. You have a yeah, of course. Rivers, of course. Yeah. And I think that's a, the transition from river fishing to lake fishing is a lot easier mm. than someone who's only ever lake fished going onto the river because... If anything, I'm not saying lakes are easier, but you ain't got to worry about currents. They're easier, mate. You, you can ain't, say they're definitely easier. Yeah, you ain't got to worry about this. So, them dials on the board with a lake, there two. might be... <laughs> yeah, yeah, there's only two. like two or three. But on a river, it's like, oh, you know, what dial is it? You know, it was 10. And it's, there's so much more. Yeah. Oh, yeah. For you, you talked about that 27 pounder being your first capture. But when you look back over the course of, of sort of your river fishing... What what captures or particular campaigns or particular fish stand out to you? What on rivers? Yeah. Um, right. So there's three. I'd say there's three that uh, maybe four, but three that like when as soon as you ask that question, it's the first three that come into my head. So obviously it was the first ever one I had that twenty seven eight mega. Um, my second. So that would have been about two thousand and fifteen that I caught that. The first one, the twenty seven pounder. Yeah, two thousand fifteen. Okay. So two years after my two years after I started learning how to carp fish, I got down the river, do you know. So like this, what I mean, it was probably my calling. I probably got a bit bored of the. I caught enough tench now and carp on the maggot gear. Like I'm going river now. Um, my second one was probably about 2018. And don't get me wrong, weren't a fish, a big fish by any standards. Um, I, 
the reason it stands out for me so much is firstly the way it looked, which we'll talk about. But secondly, it's I didn't know it was there. Do you know? I it's very contradictory now, but I say about oh, I've always tried finding them on the boat and doing all that. But sometimes you do just want to get fishing, didn't you? And you don't care where you go, what you do, you just the rods are going out. Yeah. Um so I thought, do you know what, I'll go into a different stretch I've never fished before. And they got a nice little like a like a marina there. So I've gone upstream for the marina. And you can see into the water on this little bend and it looks pretty clear. And I just thought, do you know what? It's a nice if anything, it was somewhere easy to pitch up. You weren't right. in nettles, you weren't in a load of reeds, it was a bit of grass bank, you had a a, a bench behind you from like obviously for public footpath, so you got a bench behind you, so you could sit on the bench and make your cup of tea in it. It was just a very easy place to fish. So I thought, I'm going here tonight. Um, all by myself you get your rods out Christy about 3 or 4 o'clock in the morning absolute one toner and it was the rod closest to me right in my own margin right and you know when you put your rods out you always think oh that maybe it'll go but it's the other rod that you think is going to do something yeah, yeah. I, it weren't this rod that I thought was going to go so it's quite a surprise um, got it in it was probably a common 23, 24 and at night all you do is unhook them pull the net over so they can't fucking jump out the top because you know you've had that done too many times and you're back to bed didn't you yeah daylight comes you wake up see what you got happy days when I've when I've like woke up in the morning and pulled the net back I'm like oh my god <laughs> oh my god oh my god uh, you know and it was the blackest oh, yeah. darkest common cup I've ever seen in my life and the where it's obviously a bit pissed off and they do all the peck flicks and like yeah, the, yeah. their their dorsal yeah, yeah. get all hungry yeah. you know um, when it's dorsal flicked up when it got angry you know when they're all weathered and that and it's just like the spines left yeah. of the dorsal and it's all like the skin inside caved it's gone away, all caved in yeah. and it's all like webbing ain't it and it was all like that and they're all a bit crinkled and like the mouth was perfect all barbels like it just looks like you've never been caught before <laughs> but it must have you know like from the lake it was in 10, 15 years ago or whatever, in the flood where it's come across the field. like. But in the last, it's looked after itself. Like this fish is top shelf material, you know, especially to me anyway. Yeah. So I rang my mate and I'm like, oh, I'll come down and do the photos. And we got this photo in front of this big old willow tree stump um, that's been cut down. It was all like a white willow tree stump behind me. And I've got a thick, thick green grass in front of me, like so thick it was like, the unhooking match, you know, you could just lay the carp on the yeah. grass. It was, it was beautiful, you know. And uh, yeah, that would stick for me forever because that was just that's a big one as well. To be it was one, of, it's, but it's still to this day one of the most beautiful carp I've ever seen. By by country mile, it's the most beautiful common carp I've ever I've right, ever wow. caught, caught. You know, yeah, incredible creature. Just uh, just the colours on it. It was insane. I'm sure I'll send you a picture and like this yeah, will yeah, flick yeah. up in between the <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, that, and I was, ha- yeah, it's just, it was, the, the. I don't know how to explain it. At that time, that was like the most intense my river fishing meant to me, you know? Yeah, okay. Because um, I've just caught saying that I never even knew he was there. Like, no one chases 20 pounders, really. Do you know? And especially, I don't know, it's not really a thing you go, oh, I'm going, I'm chasing a 20 pounder down the river. Because not many people really do that. No. It's more than 30s, isn't it? If you go as a 30 pounder, that's when you I get a few. No, a 20 pounder from a river still for me. Yeah, a... to, to me it's still special, but it was just, I didn't see it coming. I think that's what made it so, yeah. like, yeah, yeah. It hit home so much harder because I never see it coming. I'm like, I've contradicted myself and just rocked up at a river and just r- lobbed the rods out like a nod, which I like, usually try and not do. I usually try and do the bit of homework or at least find where they are. Yeah. So I've completely gone against the grain that way. <laughs> yeah. I've picked somewhere. I almost sound like I'm day ticket fishing down the river because I've picked just, a nice. I've picked person. somewhere really easy. In the car park, lobs the rods <laughs> out and just gone. Yeah, that'll do. And I've caught that. So it was like almost like all oh, this fucking hard work I've done. Do you know what I mean? And the one night I've just like lobbed them in. I've caught this. Um, so it makes you think again. It changes your perception on how like maybe I should just whack them out every now and then. Or well, maybe it's just <laughs> sum it up there. Yeah, so it just you, you get lucky, didn't you? But that was that was definitely something special for me. And the third, um, where I ended up having my boat down at the basin, there's like a nice, lovely basin, loads of boats over there. 
and I actually had it dry docked. I've got it, I've got the crane to lift my boat out and put it on on yeah. the bank because I was doing loads of work to it. So my my boat's on these big sleepers on the grass, and I'm probably I don't know twenty thirty yards away from the from the bank. So I'd have my rods out while I'm working on the boat. Yeah, like cutting bits of wood, you know, felting bits and putting all my electrics in and all that. I'd be fishing as well, and I think the the day before, the day before I had the the fish I'm going to go on about, I had a nice a nice mirror. Uh, no, I had a common. I had a common, a common and attention. And next day, get the rods back out, and you're not allowed to fish here. The only reason I had my rods out is because my boat's on the thing. So no one can really say anything to me. I've like loopholed it almost, you know. Can boat owners fish though? If you're not really... even boat owners can go down oh, there. Really? Yeah, there's the, no lot, yeah, because I think they've had too many people yeah. with putting a dinghy in and putting a lead through a window and that yeah. sort of thing. So it's just like strictly no fishing in this bit. I've got away with it somehow, you know, hot summer's day. Or I've got the chop saw outside. I'm cutting wood and so you know, it's a day's graft yeah, with the yeah. rods out. Um, and I'm fishing right over to the far side because I've walked around the far side, underarmed a bit of bait out, and I'm fishing over to the far side. And I'm in the boat, and the boat, to jump out of my boat, you was probably like eight, ten foot off the ground. What? And the rod's one tone, so I've like parkoured myself off the end of the boat, yeah, rolling dive off the boat. Rob Theo would love this, yeah, do you know what I mean? Him, it's a bit of him, that <laughs> Climbing up the boat. He, and yeah, yeah he, he would have, he what is it, belayed, he would have belayed me down the old I call, I call boat. The old, uh, the old mongoose, mate, because he films all the drop stuff that I do, and he is just like that, like a little yeah, mongoose, yeah, yeah. he's on it all the time. But um, I've jumped out the boat, record time, hit into it, and as soon as I hit into it, it's just gone, like flat rodded me and it ain't too wide the basin but it's quite long and it's kited and I've man there must be 30 sailing boats in there and they've got the big kiln things at the bottom yeah, in the they one. and it's kited, kited and obviously as the fish kiting I've always been under the impression I'd rather lose a fish on my terms i.e. I'm winding it so hard that the hook's pulled other than that carp making me feel like a little six-year-old child and doing me under something. I'd rather like, no, I'm getting the better of you instead of you getting the better of me. Like, I'm the one who's hooked you, mate. <laughs> that sort of thing, you know? You ain't taking right. some fucking trying to wind up, get it. Like, where they kite, if you wind, you can kind of like coax them round before yeah. they get to anything. Obviously it didn't work. Now it's like four boats down and like uh, four boats length down. But each boat has got another couple of boats next to it. Ooh. So then obviously your rod tip goes Under as far water, yeah. down as you can get it, like my arm's underwater, and you're just winding, you're just hearing, and it all cracks oh, what, you actually, tings. You're hearing it, like, ping Like, off. you can feel it and hear oh, it, you know, horrible. and it's tinging. And the only thing I can think of doing is getting further out into a marina to, like, be the other side of the boat. Yeah. So now I've, I've, I've quickly, like, loosened the line a little bit. I've jumped onto one of the boats and now I've walked across the boats. So now I'm like three, four boats out into the water. Okay. Yeah? Yeah. So now I'm like in the middle of the marine. Instead of being on the bank and the fish is down to my right, I've now got, a got myself like yeah, 40, yeah. 50 foot out into the marina and I'm like in the middle. So now I'm a bit more direct. And then I'm like hanging off the boat with my arms <sighs> under the water. Um, And then I think, oh my God, I haven't got my net. My net has got a three and a half pound tench in it because I caught a tench earlier. And I wanted a picture of it, yeah? Nice little river tench. So my mate was on his way down. I was like, oh, I'm going to get a picture of that. Anyway, so as I'm like both, ar- both arms underwater and my real, like the whole rod's disappeared. You're on your toddy. You've not got anybody around. No, no one around with me, just hanging off the edge of the boat. I see my mate walking across the, my mate at the time walking across the lock gates. So I'm like, oi! And like, obviously, you do the big wave, like, over here. Our place in Jotabin is no yeah, fish. No, I yet. know. But obviously, it's like the moment in time is yeah, you yeah. don't care about anything else. So, I, so he's come over. I was like, mate, get rid of the tent. So he's like, got the tent. So now he's standing next to me on the boat. Um, it was really murky. I remember because I was fishing lead court and I remember seeing the top of the lead court come out of the water. Once he's come under these boats and I've got it all grating and that. Uh, it, I've managed to somehow get it away from about 15 boats and it's come back out. Now it's under my rod tip. So I, I'm like, <sighs> hard bit's over. But oh, you're sitting there like, yeah. and the adrenaline's going so much like your foot's tapping on the boat, in it? And like, when you try and talk, your voice goes all jittery and that and you just, you make like, I'm just trying to get in. <laughs> like, you get a bit like that. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. And like I said, the water was so murky that when I see the top of the lead core, I couldn't see the fish still. So I still don't know what it is. 
And I'm thinking, man, but this is battling. This is proper battling. Another five minutes under rod tip lunges all the way down, like where you where you got your rod quite high up. When it lunges, you kind of follow it the rod, didn't you? Mm. So your rod's going all the way down. Next thing you know, your rod's going back underwater, and then it takes a bit of line because I'm trying to steal. I'm on a boat, so I I'm fully aware that it could go under my feet. Oh, and just loads, yes, yeah. Yeah, do you know it can, within twenty yards? I've still got three or four boats next to me, so it's still a hit and hold situation. But you kind of got to have that happy medium of are you going to pull out at the last minute or because mm. when you the longer the fight goes on the scared you get in it the, the more there's it a builds up more it builds it? up didn't it yeah it does finally man when it's come up like the lead cords come up and it's come up a bit more and then it's turn and i'm like oh my god look at the size of that and you could tell we're clear 30 you know and i know that well, this fish that i caught i've see it i don't know see it probably about 12 years before 12 years before. 12 years before at 28 pound wow. um, well I see a picture of it caught 12 years I, like I said I weren't in carp fishing then do you know but obviously I've seen a picture of it my, tell her, the mate, my mate who was with me who netted it he caught it he's the one who caught it 12 years before out of the tidal section three, three miles downstream out of the tidal bit so the only way this carp could get to where it was was either someone's caught it out the tidal yeah, and put it, it in the river yeah. or it's come back up on a high tide but either way, it's come out. This carp has come out of a, a lake, seven miles upstream, ended up in a tidal section, yeah, and then, then got put into this canal section. And then obviously, twelve years later, I've caught it. But in the meantime, I see it. Dan Yeoman's caught it at twenty-eight pounds years before I caught it. Did it? Yeah, caught it twenty-eight pound. Because I remember seeing the picture with it, with it next to the crane and that, and I was like, "Oh my god!" Oh, look I, at yeah, that. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, he had it in a cold, cold time of year, I think. And I didn't see it again for ages. So when it popped up, it kind of like, bang, it's that fish. Yeah. And I was like, oh my God, it's still in it. You know? Um, get it in the net and like, fuck, you know, sit down with your mate, you think, oh my God, like, it's the, at this point, it's the most intense battle I've ever had with a cart. Mm. And obviously the most exhilarating. you got to imagine I've got loads of public people around, you know, the pubs are open. Yeah. Like you can see them across the river. You've got all the people on the boats and that. I'm doing something that I shouldn't be doing. I'm on someone else's boat, which is a no-no. Do you know what I mean? I'm like jungle gymming across people's boats to try and hook this car. But it's all in the heat of the moment, isn't it? So obviously once I've like stopped shaking like a little kid and I've got myself together, you know, you've got to snap out of it, ain't you? Yeah, of course. Realised what it was. And then my mate was like, oh my God, it's that car I had. And then it's like, King hell, geez, you had that 12 years ago. That's mental, like, isn't it? Honestly, so now this carp's got a proper story to it. Yeah. Um, and the more you the more like you realise, the more like influential the capture is, isn't it? It's more... Yeah, definitely. The magnitude of it like just gets bigger and bigger, you know? Um, and I weighed it, it was £35.9. That's massive, man. And I couldn't believe it, man. Like, I'm, yeah. Do you think you'll ever beat that? I'd, like, I'd hope so. I, I hope so. But the thing is... First of all, I don't mind if I don't. Yeah. Do you know I'm not one yeah. to I'm not one to go and be like I've got to go and beat my river PB. I'm going to do anything I can to do it because I, I I like the challenge of river fishing, not how big the carp are. It's more like if yeah. I catch one, I catch one, and that's it. It's the there's a certain element of there's a mission, but then there's also pleasure. Do you know what I mean some people just flat out will put a thirty pounder back because it ain't the one they want. Like out of a lake, wouldn't they? Do you know if you're yeah, chasing yeah, a fifty yeah, pound? Okay, yeah. Do you know? Oh, it ain't the one. Put it back. Like, well, I don't know. I'm not like that. So I might never beat it. Probably not out of there because I don't know if there's any bigger in there than yeah, that. Not out of there, so I'd have to not. go elsewhere. And I've quite liked this river, so I'm quite happy just to carry on catching a few twenties. And that's an incredible. I, I, fish, yeah, man. one day maybe I'll catch it if I really have the hunger to, you know. But at the minute, it's just enjoying fishing. Like you say, if it was about that. If it was about the size of them... I'd be up the Thames and I'd... You would be at the Thames. You wouldn't be where you are. Yeah, I wouldn't be down a little 14-mile intimate little river mm. in the middle of Essex, do you know what I mean? As if that's had a £35. But, but it's it? done for... I voted it for my pal. That uh, was recently, wasn't it? Yeah, £38. Wow, pound. So Rob, Theo pound. was there because... That's right. Rob had it about a week after I had it, I think. A pound bigger. Yeah. He had it like yeah. 37 or whatever, so it was... Well, it's dodgy scales, isn't it, Dodgy mate? scales again. <laughs> but he stacked the weight on. But he was there... So basically, I caught that big mirror put it back yeah um and then rob's come down 
And as I'm sitting there chatting to Rob, going, oh, yeah, man, I literally just had this. The rod's gone again. And it was a £24 mirror. But the most amazing thing about the mirror I caught next as well is it had a big scar from, like, just above its nose all the way through its lip to its chin. But it was like a sabre tooth, like, Ooh, battle scar. And it's obviously where not has grabbed it on mm. its nose because it had this little bulbous bit on the end of its nose. It was still a bit white, so it literally just finished yeah, healing. Fresh. And it had this big scar through it. And I called it Rhino because of a little lump on it. But in the pictures, you can see it as clear as day. Well, I'll make sure I'll send you a picture of that. You can see it's clear as day, this big, massive scar straight through its lip where it's been auto dodged. Um, and Rob done me the photos and that, and he done me so proud, man. He done me so top, proud. Bro, top, like. Yeah, pucker photos they were. But, um, Mega fish, mate, them. Yeah, oh, yeah, so them three captures, the my first ever river carp, the mega black common, and that 35.9, they're probably like my top shelf river carp that I've caught, you know. And they, and each one is a fair few years apart. It's not like I've had a, a season of catching big ones. Or, yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you know, it's graft. And a lot of times you've been down there with your mates, you've had a barbecue you don't catch or you might have a bream or there's been a lot of stepping stones. That's what someone said to me once. They're stepping stones to your red letter session. Mate, that's qu- they're quality and fish like, when you look yeah. back. They're special, they are. Yeah, definitely. Proper, proper and each one, you, you're never the same person after, do you know? I think... I don't know. It's like you evolve a little bit more after each capture, didn't you? You have a bit more of an understanding or a bit of more of like... Yeah, a, you get something from it, of course. Yeah, you know. I, every, and I really feel that with my fishing. I think every, even this season with my pike fishing, I am... A, You've battered it, I'm mate. a completely different person, fisherman, now than what I was at the beginning of the pike season. And I'm a completely different person from what I was... In the carp season before, do you know? And you started the pike season as me, and you've ended it as Mick Brown. Mate. Oh, mate! You know, I'm the what, Duke. I mean, I'm the Duke now. Twenties and thirty. You've had a couple of thirties. Uh, so yeah, I've had this can season. We say this. We yeah. can we say this. We yeah. can say this. Can't yeah, we? we can say this. Um, let's start. Shall I start small? So in the last three weeks, start small. <laughs> in the last three weeks, I've had a twenty-two. <laughs> That's small. That a twenty-five, a twenty-nine, a twenty-nine ten, a thirty-pound twelve, and a thirty-one. Um, and my very good friend Toby, who I've been going with as well. Um, he's just really started pike fishing this year, um, and he's he had his what, first. He's seen those fish. Yeah, he's had his, he had his first twenty from a lake in Chelmsford uh, with his friend. So like, hats off to Toby, your first ever twenty pounder. Yes, that is landmark. fucking big ups, yeah. mate. And then the little Jamie Git goes and braces a pair of twenty four pounders on the same trip, and I'm going to him. I've never braced a pair of twenties in my life, but then obviously the next trip I've done the twenty nine and the twenty five. So I was like, oh, I've got you now, boy. Um, but yeah, so obviously. Oh, that's incredible. Obviously, even though it's in such a short amount of time, you can't, no one can say that you'll be the same person before and after that. Do you know what I mean? Like, you, it changes you as a fisherman. You, yeah, you have a yeah, higher definitely. understanding of things, or if any, even if it changes your confidence a slight bit, maybe if you get a bit more confident, like you'll go on to your next adventure with a bit more yeah, you've done conviction, it. you know? Um, yeah. So yeah, it's, it, it's incredible how you. I, I'm quite. I can. I can see it. I can see it as clear as day that how my fishing has have changed me and evolved me. And yeah, it's quite. I don't know. That's the experience it gives you in it. And I, people say the same on lakes. You know, once you've completed that target fish. Yeah. Yeah, and the, all that knowledge you've learned over chasing that carp for three years on a hundred acre gravel pit. You are different at the end. Of course, of course, it has to. It has to yeah, change. and it's. Uh, I think that's one of the most wonderful things with fishing. Like, you ain't ever as good as you think you are, or like you can always be better. Yeah, yeah, yeah? you're always learning. Like 100%. you can always be that. You can always do something that. Uh, yeah, it's, them dials never stop turning. I think that's what yeah. it is. They never stop, do they? For you, and we'll, we'll, before we move away from river fishing, predation otters. We mentioned it a couple of times about the stories and the scars. Are you seeing them on the river? Are they oh like my. bold as brass in Oh, my God. Honestly, it you, is... Have you noticed that change in, over the years? Um, so, a couple of different rivers I could think of. So, like, when I go to the broads, is there, I see an otter. Oh, broads. Yeah, oh, I've mate. Seen them, Do you know, it was 180 different breeding pairs mm. of otters on the broads. 180. I think that's the first place I saw one on, on, ah. on the river, and it came off a little a house, a lawn, and I honestly thought it was a Labrador. I thought it was someone's Labrador yeah. jumped in. Oh, they're, they're a massive dog. They're otter. so brass out there. Do you know what I mean? They it's don't okay. care. Like, amount of times I've seen one pick up and it's just munching a silver, then it'll go back down. Like, they do not care. But um, it's like our river. Tell a lie. 
even going on about the predation and like how much they do massacre fish and kill the car, they still do find the balance to an extent. Mm. And in day, they've been in the rivers the last twenty years. It's only the the last ten that they really boomed. Do you know? Yeah, the last ten. Um, is the, yeah. There's still carp in every river, and people still catch loads of carp. People still catch loads of chub, loads of big perch, loads of big pike. So even though they do have an Im- uh, an impact to some extent. If they were as bad as what people think they would be, there wouldn't be no fish left, would there? No, too right. There wouldn't be a fishery. Um, but going back to how many I see, untold. Even on our little river, you know where my boat is, it is un- stupid amounts of otters. It's like unbelievable, you know? And you, you talk to fishermen, you'd be like, seen an otter today? And they go, no, I've never seen an otter. And you're like... You've been sleeping, Where mate. the fuck have you been? Yeah. Like, And they're like, oh, is there otters in here? And I'm like, mate, where have you been? They are, mate, but also like one you night, see them. One night, I actually, I just got to say this because I can remember it, it's clear as day. One night, it was me, my twin brother, and one of my really good friends, Lewis, who lives in the village. And I've convinced them boys to come down and do a night with me. Um, and I'm on the church stretch. Yeah. Sh- shut up, Doris. Having a little growl. I heard some cats. Doris? Outside. She yes. heard otter, mate. That's I heard why. an otter. Yeah, he's talking about otters. Cool, if I say muntjac, she'll know, look. <laughs> <laughs> but... Um, it's got dark. Everyone's getting ready for bed. We've just had a nice evening down the river. And as you do, before you get in your bivy, you have one last look up the river, one last look down. Didn't you? Yeah. Check everything's all right. You turn around and get yourself in the in the bed chair. I've had a look upstream. Yeah, it looks nice. You look downstream. When I've looked down, in the middle of the river, I can see this V. Like the V of like a... So the same V is what a swan makes. You know a swan when it's swimming yeah. and they got the wake behind them, a little V wake. Well, it looks just like that, but yet there was no swan. So I'm like, how bizarre. So then it's clocked. I'm like, oh my God, it's an otter. Like, it's a, like straight away, I've gone, oh my God, it's an otter. I know what it is. So I've run up to my mate Lewis and Jamie. I've gone, right, boys, get your trainers on. Stay really quiet, Yeah. In a second, we're going to switch these head torches on and there's going to be a knot out in front of us. And they're like, yeah, 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 no worries. And we're whispering and that. So they've got trainers on. Like, and literally, it's probably 50 yards downstream. So by the time we've got our bits on and it, it's going to be out in front of us, yeah, we've got yeah. just enough time to spot it. Anyway, so I'm like, boys, you ready? Head torch goes on. There were six. Oh, my God, mate. There were six the of them. family on an There outing. were six of them, Yeah. You would think I'm lying when I told you the following morning I had a twenty pound mirror, wouldn't you? That's mad, isn't it? I had a twenty pound mirror the following morning, over the spot that six otters had just swum on. That's... Like what? How do you like? And this is what I mean, evolving as an angle. Like each trip, each session, you learn something, and that was like, oh fucking hell, <laughs> mate! I had half a dozen carp eating creatures like come over my spot last night and I've just bagged a wacker, you know? Like, how do you do it? They coexist, mate. I think, like... And I've always been yeah. under the impression of, like, once a carp gets spooked, if a, you God. know? Like, on lakes and that, if... I, I think could, it's different on lakes, though, Yeah, mate. so, like, Snake Pit. Mm. I know that didn't do a bite for ages after it got an otter on it because yeah. they just all hid up scared. Yeah. And obviously that gets in your head, then you have that mentality of, oh, if there's not about, we won't catch nothing. But that was, like... Oh, yeah, we will. <laughs> like, it don't matter. That's oh, yeah. Man, oh, you see an otter? Yeah, that don't matter. <laughs> Do you know? It don't. And it kind of give me that sort of mentality of don't pack your rods up because you're seeing an otter and go home. Because a lot of people would go, oh, there's an otter yeah. about We're going home. Yeah, I didn't fish last night. I see an otter. But I think, and? <laughs> yeah, it gives you a uh, well, fair play. Yeah. That's, um, There's fucking six, six of them, them, man. It was unbelievable. Six of them. Oh, fucking good. Because obviously, once you turn the lights on, man, you just see it. Six pairs of eyes, oh. like illuminate the river. That's not what you want to see on your spot. It's a it? bit eerie as well. In the same hand, it's a bit like ooh, <laughs> that's a bit scary. Mate, they are incredible, like incredible, incredible predators, creatures, mate. mate. Incredible, Isn't they? And like when you really do look at them close. <laughs> I mean, when I've been up on the broads, I've seen one, um, and I know, I know it's old age. Basically, an otter is part of the Muscovy family, so it's same as your badgers, your weasels, and all that sort of thing. Yeah. And I've I've had ferrets before, like when we've gone rabbiting and things like that. And when your ferrets get really old, they wither up and their backs get really arched. And they all like hunch back and they go a bit all like, like, you know. And I was on the broads and I'm sitting there on this jetty and as far away from me to you, an otter has come walking past me. Yeah. 
It's all hunchbacked up. It's all got all so cub- quasi-modo looking rat thing. Yeah? And it's just like, <laughs> like a bit worn out, mate. Like this thing yeah. must have been 20 year old. And they obviously don't live that long. But it, you could tell it was like at the end of its life. Like if it had a walking, it should have had a walking stick. That was yeah. it was in my frame. But to then see like an otter, but then see different characteristics and otters and like, Different features and like you said, that one you see on the lawn looked like a Labrador. Oh, man. Now this one looks like a rat. Yeah, it was so old and what? Do you know what I mean? So the sizes they get and do you know the females are beautiful looking creatures and yeah, it's just I wouldn't want a fifty fifty with them, mate. They no would, way. Like, I mean yeah. that one that snaps my reel enough. Yeah, do you know some of them are powerful big dogs that yeah. <laughs> do you know <laughs> like dogs. a little old Doris? Like when I'm that fishing down, like, I would never want Doris to get. No, you don't an altercation with an otter because she would get eaten alive. I said, you know, they got thumbs in that. They would just get her in a headlock. Like, (laughs) mate, that was a mega chapter on the old rivers. Uh, But you're not limited just to rivers, mate. You have ventured onto a few waters, mate, and and very much that theme that you do keep with your river fishing as in the unknown and that sort of opportunist adventuring style angling. That makes its way into your lake fishing as well, doesn't it? Of course. Um, like I said earlier, yeah, I, d- I do follow a lot of what I've learned on the rivers and how I've adapted to be that sort of river pirate. <laughs> I then do take that onto the lakes. Um, like I said, like I mean, yeah, I openly say I've never, it, I've never gone to the commercial day to get like the the linear fisheries that sort of thing. I, I, I've never done anything like that, or. Um, Maybe quiet little club lakes, but a lot of them, it's just like, I don't know, you know, the unknown, you drive past a lake that's in the middle of nowhere and you think, oh, I wonder what's in there. And there's only one way to find out, that sort of thing. Or just little whispers, you know. Yeah, so you've got some sort of intel on some Some places. Some tiny little snippets, like you've always got to have that little sliver of information or... Mm. Yeah, I'm quite grateful that me and Doris get to have a walk anywhere. Like, do you know, we'll stop somewhere, have a little walk around the lake. Doris gets to have a wander around and I get to look for sank on the way. So one one place that probably stands in mind for like that adventure inside of unknown lake fishing. Yeah. Went 20 minutes away from my home. 15 years ago, they've dug an irrigation lake. I don't know, 20 acres in size. But I remember as a little boy seeing diggers at the bottom of it. Right. Do you know? Um, yeah. So like 20 years later, it's filled with water. There's like growing, sprouting willow trees. All the willow trees are probably 20 foot high now. Um, I heard a whisper 10, 10 years ago or whatever. Or I heard a whisper that someone put fish in there 10 or so years ago. Okay. See some pictures of them like four or five pound going in, do you know? So I thought, oh, there's carp in there. I wonder how big they got. Um, first time I ever walked it, I only ever see tiny little things. Mm. And then the second time I walked it, I see the bigger, they must have had two different shoals. You know, I see the small shoal and then I see the big shoal and I was like, oh my God, there's 20s. So it was kind of the start of that, I don't know, pioneering sort of adventure inside of, and yeah, that was, that suited me down to the ground. That was, that was almost like me leaving the river and going on to, it was carrying on the adventure, you know. It's the same theme though, isn't it? It's so it's the same theme, yeah. It's that same... The same. Are, you, are you locating them? Like, are you, are you just basically walking it daytime? Are you rocking up at using a yeah, headset? So, what are you doing? Well, I'm a, I'm very seasonal. So you got to think all winter time I'm pike fishing. Mm. Then the spring times and I'm still down the river till March the fifteenth, and then the close season starts. So after March, we the the weather's on its way, isn't it? Yeah. The carp have the carp have woke up by then. In yeah. any lake, March gone March, you are you're well on the way to being able to go to a lake and see something. Mm. So yeah, the adventuring starts there, I suppose. As soon as them rivers shut, my adventuring around lakes become more frequent because yeah. I can walk Doris around there instead of going down the river. I, I, as much as I love the river, I, I kind of tend to leave it alone in a close season because there's no. I, I don't want to tease myself if anything, you know. So yeah, I go and do that adventuring around these lakes and I find them like that. You might find, I don't know, a few in a reed bed or do you know you might see a few stick their dorsals out in the lake or mm. yeah so it's opportunistic in, in essence Very that window of opportunity like you say with the close season allows you to explore a little bit of that yeah and it kind of gives me um, that them few months is like setting me up for the the summer and autumn ahead yeah do you know otherwise you're I don't know you like to get things ahead start don't you you want to get make sure you're ready 
Yeah, you hit anything. the ground running, don't you? Hit the ground running, don't you? Yeah. yeah, exactly that, exactly yeah. that. For you, standout captures lake-wise in these sort of periods of time, what what comes to mind in terms of that? We've been through the river captures and extensively um, looked at that. Well, definitely, when, when I go on about this irrigation, this irrigation farm, um, that stands out to me because as I got to be a, more aware of what was in there and what was about and what things you see, then all of a sudden I started to realise... It's actually a very weird coincidence, right? So a lot of the fish in there, mm. what, what I did come to find out, basically when it was dug and it got put into lake, the people in the neighbouring area did try and get a fishing lake on it. Do you know what I mean? They did try and give oh, right. the, the farmer money and they was going to, they was on their way to making it a syndicate. So fish were put in there. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And a certain amount of fish somehow, like, through people's bad habits, uh, come from the river. Right. So, like, okay. all of a sudden, quite a few of these river fish, not the ones I've caught, this is long before my time. They've been moved in. Like, escapees from the lake have turned up yeah. in the river, then these yeah. people have caught them from the river and put them back in this lake to start new life as a syndicate, what they want to make, you know. That whole pair, that whole plan fell through. The farmer then said, no one's ever allowed to fish it. No one's ever allowed there, blah, right. blah, you know. So, all of a sudden, there's a 20-acre lake, brand new, up to 60 foot deep. Like, it's a big, deep pit. 60 oh, foot deep? Me- mentally deep, do you know? Like, you could lose diggers in it. Like, it's ma- like, do you know? Oh, it is deep. Yeah. Especially round here. Yeah, yeah, it's massively deep. Um, all of a sudden, you've got this place that's been like the start of its life. Do you know? It's beginning its life cycle. It's got carpet in there. I found it 10 years later. So all these carpet that have been put in there 10 years ago, these all got big. You can understand, mm. like, the rhythm that's going to happen, you know? Um... I forgot where I was going with that. You were talking about significant caps. Significant caps, that's right. So um, some of these fish that got put in there, upper 20s, well, now one was 45, the other was 39, and then there was another good common at 35. But when I first started there, I was working a mile away. I was still on a moped. I was was scaffolding. I was working a mile away at site, and I'd go over there on my break time um, Mm. just for a smoke and just have a walkabout. All of a sudden, I see these these fish and one of them was like a good good 30 this is probably probably just at the beginning of summer maybe just after they spawned right um and i couldn't help myself i went to the shop before i went back to site and bought a couple of tins of sweet corn went back to the lake put the sweet corn in then after work i went straight home got my rod and i went down there and i hid my, my i hid my moped off the road so no one could see i was there yeah and uh Put one rod in onto the spot and I could see it all fizzing and that. I've got the videos on my phone of them all bubbling and stuff. Wow. Yeah, it's like incredible, you know. And when I went to put my second rod out, the first one's gone. So it was like seconds, man. I could not believe it. Uh, and it took me straight out to the lake and just done me. Lost everything, what, do you no know way. what I mean? Yeah, cut me off somewhere. Lo and behold, about four or five days later, I see the carpet I lost because it had a little snowman in its mouth and it was a black and white one. We ended up calling it the cow. <laughs> <laughs> and like it was the whole bottom half of it was completely white, but the whole top was completely black. So Mental. obviously like a koi that someone's put in there, like probably from the town or something, you know? Yeah, yeah. God knows what's going like when you think about it, God knows what goes in there. Because someone goes, oh, I don't want this pond no more. Yeah, exactly, tip them in. Yeah. yeah. But then I did see another big one. So like I'm well disheartened. I thought I've spooked this spot. So I went right to the far end and I found another group of fish. And um I was fishing a Ronnie rig and I put one right in the margin. I'll tell you a story. Right, so when I, a couple of days before, when I when I see them carp, mm. there was one in particular, the big one, where I was like upper 30s, and it was like a lot tighter to the bank than all the others. I was like, man, you love a margin. Yeah. Anyway, so when I've lost this, a couple of days later, I've lost this fish, gone up to the How fight. big was this black and white? It went 20 poundish. Oh, so still a, yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, when I've gone up to the other end, I've put this little Ronnie in about two foot of water. And then I put another rod about four or five foot of water. And as I put the second rod out, I've kind of half spooked the shoal. So they've kind of slowly drifted out. Mm. And I'm like, oh man, I've blown it again. And it's a bit annoying, isn't it, when you blow it? Anyway, I've seen this mirror, the big one, like the one that I thought was the big one. And I, I gospel truth, I sat there and spoke to myself and I went, you love a margin. And as I said that, yeah, it is beelined for this fucking yellow pop-up in two foot of water at my feet. 
And as soon as it hit it and hooked it, it probably only took 10 yards and started wallowing, man. So I'm like knee deep in the water. I've netted it. And my first carp out of there hooks 36 pound. No. So I'm like, oh my God. Oh my God. I've, like, and I said to my, I thought to myself, well, I've done it. Like, see you later. Yeah. Completed. See you That's later. That's the big one. The big one. Yeah. I've had it. The, the big one. I've had it. Do you know what I mean? This is where hindsight is a beautiful thing and never underestimate a water because I probably left it. So this was summer sort of time. This was just before lockdown, I think. Right. No, it might have been two seasons before lockdown. Anyway, lockdown come. That was the next time I was going to venture back on this lake. And it was only because my mate was like, oh, you had that 36 out of so-and-so. I want to go and give it a go. Yeah. So him and my pal go over there. Well, my pal had the 36 that I had. But had it at forty five pound twelve, so I'm like, oh Jesus fucking Christ, you know, oh shit. And then my mate had a thirty nine, another like, fish. one of the most unbelievable carp I've ever seen in my life. And I've got a picture of this exact carp eight years before or ten years before oh, when it got put in at like four pound. Yeah, that's amazing. So isn't you it? can like, and the these carp got taken out of a out of a you know like a housing estate lake, you know, yeah, when yeah. it's got the soak away lake. The council obviously just put a load of baby carp in there. And the, the skeezers obviously took them out of this little pond and <laughs> lobbed them in here. But 10 years later, they've grown massive. How are they growing that much? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what strain of carp they were. I don't know where they bought them from. But these just were freak fish. And obviously and that's when you start thinking, my God, there's a few more. Yeah. Before we know it, it got a bit of a rat race over there between all us and like me and all my mates. Mm. Where my mate Tom had the 39, then he had a 35 pound common, then he had a 38 pound common. Wow. And like, yeah. So all of a sudden, there's like quite a few 30s in there. And that's when I really went back and gave it another hard go. Um, So two two significant captures out of that lake. Obviously, my first ever one was yep. the 36, and it was like a levery, mirrory sort of thing. Probably come, and this is the weird thing, because when you think these are river fish, yep. yeah, that carp probably come from the same lake as what my big one did out of the canal. Yeah. Do you know? Because it would have gone, like, it could have been lost in the same flood. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Like, and, mate, he caught it out of the tidal bit where the big one, he caught the big one from, but obviously that one ended up somewhere else. Like, so it's unbelievable how intertwined these carp can be, you know? Mm. And how, like, each lake's probably got a few from each lake. And each yeah, it's lake. a right mix. Yeah, match, it's a it? proper mixed bag. Once I see my mate have that 30 pound common, it was a big one with black eyes and it was just thick, massive pecs. And that one really stood out to me. Um, it took me two years to catch that. I kept caught it. I caught it in September at 35 pound. But it was one of them fish. Like I said, I don't really target fish yeah, too much. Yeah, it sounds a bit more targeted that though, mate. Um, but something come over me with that fish. Did it? Yeah, something really come over me. I don't know why. I don't know what really... It's just something... It, I I think it's because I went over there. You got to think I was probably the first, one of the first to go over there. No one else was there, and I, I caught this thirty six. And the only reason my mates turned up is because they knew I caught yeah. that out of there. But then all of a sudden, my mates have caught more big ones than what I could have possibly thought was in there. So I kind of felt a bit like, not I deserve it, but I should have done more when I had it to myself. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So I kind of felt a bit like, oh, what an idiot. And I think that made me go a bit harder to try and catch the, the ones I wanted. And yeah, I did. I, like I said, in the end, I got a £35. Pound, um, and I got all these big apple trees behind me and like all fruited apple trees and that. And yeah. oh, it was just incredible, you know, and I got my twin brothers to come down and do the photos with me in the morning and weigh it. And it was all like misty morning and you were in thick grass and that with all these fruit trees around you, like nightingale in, in the background and that. So yeah, that was really, really significant capture. That lake is a significant lake if I'm... If anything, that really, that was like one of the best. Because like, like I said, I love my adventuring. And that was like the top shelf adventuring. Yeah, Unknown. Yeah. yeah, all me. Yeah. And when I've, I think on one of my SIP videos, on one of my wild bands, I spoke about it. And it was like, I don't do too well against other anglers. Probably why I don't do the club lakes and don't do the day tickets and that. Because it's hard enough trying to catch a carp, let alone if, mm. if mate next door has got the, the peg where the carp are in and you can't get nowhere to, near the carp so you've just got to spend 30 quid for the night to put in a load of bait and catch nothing because you can't even get on the fish like to me that is too much of a roulette it's too much of a what if but, yeah there's not a lot in your control there, but this there, 20 acre water 
if they weren't in one corner, I can move and go to the next corner. Yeah. If they're not in that, I can go to the next one and like I could dot my rods around and have one on a receiver just so, so it's further enough away. I can just about pick it up on the receiver. And where it's such a vast open amount of water, you, you've got yeah. plenty enough time to get to your rods. And so it was very, yeah, that was, that was intense, man. That was really intense, all that. And them two significant, yeah, them two captures meant the world to me because other than uh, uh, one friend or maybe two, no one else has got them in their album. And that, I really liked that. I really liked the, I've not only have I adventured and carried on my sort of way I deal with the river onto a lake, I've also got the whole place to myself and I've caught a couple of 30s. Yeah, that, and I'm not really a big fish it. fisherman. So like to me, to catch 30s, that's, you know. That's a big fish. Yeah, right? man. Unbelievable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Known or unknown, that is a big carp, mate. Yeah. 30 pounds. Fair I couldn't option, believe though. it. I couldn't believe it. Uh, prospects for that in the future? Are you going to do some more lake stuff or have you got more designs on sort of river? or Because realistically, mate, if I look at what you're talking about there, these opportunities nowadays... Few and far between. Very few and far between. You yeah. know what it's like. Somebody could put a picture up on social media and it, even if you've never seen that cart before, it's not too long before somebody's got a bit of information as to where oh, it's come mate, from. Oh, mate, me and my pals... We, I'm almost too good at it, I think, sometimes. Mm. Like, if you want to know... I was watching a YouTube on video, uh, a, a video on YouTube the other day of someone perch fishing, catching a couple of big falls and that. And within about a minute and a half, me and my mate, it's not only found the exact bridge the mate he was on, we found out, like, what pub it was next to, how you get there, how... Yeah, like, yeah, and you think, that's all because you've seen a little sign in the corner of a video going, this district council... And all of a sudden, there's a pub next to him, and you go, "What's the name of that pub?" And it was done. You know what I mean? Next thing, no trips booked, and you're there. So it's very, very, very easy to to. And you wouldn't know that you're doing it, but like, let's say someone come over there in the middle of my campaign and crushed my dreams. Yeah, they wouldn't. They wouldn't do it out of spite. They ain't done it because oh, Finn's over there. We don't like him. We're gonna go and ruin his fishing. They're doing yeah, it no. because yeah, I might have put the same cup on Insta, and someone's gone. I know where that is. Do you know? And it's so quick for, for things that's very, very quick to unfold nowadays. Certainly so, um, is, mate. So like to find them them hidden bits, oh man, it rarer than hen's teeth, really. How did you feel about that when you did the whole sip thing? I mean, A, how did that come to be? Because obviously that series has been very popular because you are so unique and you are you as a character. But also... Did you feel some sense of responsibility, a bit of protection around your own fishing, but also responsibility in terms of people that you know that fish the same area? You don't want basically a mass to descend upon the river because you've put a picture up or filmed something where, yeah, where you're there. Of course, of course. And I think I've got a little bit of backlash about a few bits on the river and stuff. But then I, mate, I don't know if it's me being naive, but I'm under the impression. Why would someone watch like one of my videos and then chase a twenty pound carp that I've caught? Like, there's far bigger and more exciting things to do than see what I'm up to and then try and copy. If you know what I mean, right? Like to me, I'm fishing. It's like, it's, there's nothing special. It's just what I do. There's to me, it's not special. It's just what I enjoy. You know. Mm. So I kind of had the impression of, so you got to keep things quiet to an extent. You know, you can't give everything away. But then at the same time, you can't be so secretive that. You don't give anything away like people. It's nice to share your stories and how happy things made you. And so, like, example, the wild man's I've done on my boat down the river. Yeah. Yeah, some people might look at it and go, I know where that is. Or go, oh, Finn caught a nice 20-pounder. But uh, how many of them are actually going to go out their way to really try and catch? How did it come about you doing that? Because I've spoke to Elle about this in regards to sort of drawing the line, putting posts up and I know he he does it really retrospectively so the posts he's putting up have happened a while back he's done he's done his fishing and, and he sort of moved yeah on. yeah you he, like belated but, it so yeah. exactly but for him I get it because his job he's got to put something up in the same way that we all do we've got to try and keep sort of content going on because it is is part of the job role really for you preceding this before you came into sort of the sip you didn't necessarily need to do that for work, did you? Or to, no. or for that. So how how did that all come to be? Because your style of angling doesn't necessarily marry up with like being out there in terms of the public eye. Because no, as you say, it's quite a secret squirrel. Majority of like even people, the majority of people who've sat in this seat where I'm sat now, mm. Hassan, and you've podcasted, ninety percent of them are probably 
big fish syndicate angle. Literally, we've got an album that people want to die for. Do you know? Yeah. They've got had multiple forties or some of the best carp in the country. Do you know? That's probably why I said to you, "Fuck got I'm like, what the fuck am I sat here? Oh, but yeah, like you said, no, it's because I do things different. Um, but it, I think that just come about. Obviously, I'm quite good friends with Elliot. Yeah. Um, I was long before we started the SIP. So I think that helped a bit. Um, and maybe same as what you said, he just see that maybe I've done things differently. Quite, there's not many people doing it how I do it. So yeah. it's like a different branch to the carp fishing. And some people, maybe some people can resonate with me a bit more than most because I do it for the pleasure as well. I'm not just, a, I'm not a big fish angler. So it ain't like I'm putting in like, hard 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 graft on a syndicate that you ain't going to be able to get in mm. like, you know like someone's doing a video on a yeah. syndicate that's taken them five years to get on it's cost them thousands of pounds like a lot of people can't can't like I don't know re- yeah like resonate with that because it's going to take them a long time to get on that lake and catch them carp but someone can watch me and go I can go down the river for nothing exactly yeah and I can buy a bag yeah. of bait and I can just go and I can do that for nothing and uh, and it's the enjoyment side of it. And people like, I do it for the enjoyment rather than how big the fish are. So I think people can understand that a lot easier and it's a lot more doable. So I think that that's why yeah. Elliot kind of said, oh, we'll do a wild man. Cause it kind of gives you, it's a different, a completely different aspect of yeah, definitely. fishing. Do you know? that, that's what I see. I see. And, and that's what I said at the start of the podcast is that uniqueness. I compare you to probably anybody else who's been in that seat. There's a few similarities with a couple of lads, Jacob similar. He's done a few campaigns. Alfie Russell, he's done some similar yeah. things, but again, for you, it is, it's, it's more the lifestyle that comes with that as well to a regard that that is so different. I completely see that. I completely see the fact that it is, for somebody who's watching it, very different from your normal carp. Man goes to syndicate that maybe you can't fish. Man catches big fish. Like the same storyline that you see is very different with you because there is that whole element of lifestyle in there and it's accessible and everything else. I completely see that. For me, what what the sort of, the thing that I'm wanting to know is for you as an individual with a beautiful path paved out to go fishing whenever you want on all these cool places that are all you and then transferring that into film, there is a potential for that to become harder and harder to find and do because Massively, of that. Yeah, of course it is. How um, did you feel about all as that? As soon as you get like, like we literally just said, like you can give someone the smallest snippet oh. of information and it can blow out to next thing you know, you'll never even get in that same spot. Um, I don't really know. I don't know. It's a tough one, that. Did you feel a, a bit, I don't know. I mean, you trust Elliot because you're mates with him and he's yeah. good at what he don't does. Don't get it wrong. Some things I film, I'm like, Elliot, don't put that in. Yeah, yeah, of course. Do you know, don't, I can't use that. Like, And at the time I filmed it because I thought, oh, I might. But then I look back and you think, and you sit there and think, no, nah, that's too much. I can't use that because that is really going to have a detrimental effect on my fishing. Because you've got, you can only... You can give some, but you can't give everything. Do you know yeah. what I mean? There's a lot of things. There's a, I mean, I'm out like a lot, man, mm. three or four times. It might only be a couple hour sessions, especially over the winter for my pike fishing. But man, if I sh- if I filmed everything I've done at pike fishing, I some people probably wouldn't wouldn't not like wouldn't like what I get up to, yeah, or yeah. wouldn't accept the like the 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 lengths I go to to do what I do and catch what I catch. So, yeah, I only let people see so much of how much fun I have because, like, I don't know, it's a funny thing to say, but, like, obviously on film it looks like I have a lot of fun, but believe me, I have a lot Graph. more fun yeah, than that, yeah, yeah, do you know? Yeah. Like, yeah. I, I only give so much away and the rest is completely me, you know? I'm glad you've done it, mate, and to be fair, like, if anybody's not watched them, yeah, head to sip, they are brilliant videos, mate. They're very different and I think they do round off all right, you can't put all the information in, but I think they do really give a good insight into you as a person and what that means day to day, which I've seen through sort of speaking to you in this pod because we haven't had much contact. No, no, in this. no. So it's been a real good insight into that. You also, if I'm right in saying this, and I may be completely wrong, you also do trips on the river, don't you? Yeah, so... So you offer that as like people yeah, to come on. Yeah, um, and last year, touch wood... Every every person I had on my boat last year, not a single person blanked. No way. Not a single person blanked. You know, out of like over a dozen people. Oh, every... So you actively guide them. It's not yeah, like... actively oh, guide them. Wow. Yeah, and every single person caught, which was like up to me. Obviously, 
you're there to make sure someone catches, you know, that mm. is your job. I'm gu- guiding someone on a river that I feel like I know well enough that I've got a good chance of catching a fish for him, you know. Um, and yeah, I just, yeah, I couldn't put a foot wrong. And that's when I, and that really cemented the fact with me that I am in tune with that river. And I do know, and you do understand the habits and. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, which don't happen every time. It don't, it really don't. But I got it on the head last year. No, so but again, it's that knowledge factor, isn't it? If you go in a linear, yeah. you ring up Tom Maker. If you go in it, do you know what I mean? Yeah, of course, like, of course. And it's like you live and breathe. At the end of the day, my boat's there. I live like half the week there. Yeah. I'm there all the time. Do you know, I go down there to take Doris or walk. go down there to have cups of tea with like all my friends who have the boats down there. I go down there fishing for my own benefit. Mm. And then, do you know, and I've done this for years. Like, And uh, maybe I just gained enough confidence, and especially after the sit films and that. And people obviously enjoyed my lifestyle. I thought, well, maybe I could offer a bit of my lifestyle to others yeah. and give them a bit of variation. And yeah, it just went really, really well. Like um, the last person I took, and it was the best session of the year. I took Mike Holly. Mike Holly come down. Yes, I saw and, and we, that. We done yeah, a. He had loads. We done a. We done a film. Baitworks film, yeah. Baitworks film. He done. T- he caught ten that night. He's a terminator. He Mike caught Holly. ten that night, and honestly, man, like ten of the best. I reckon six of them were over twenty. Um, I think four four of the twenties were mirrors. Yeah. So like he literally, other than the big one, he's ticked he a teamed it, mate. Yeah. I was like, Mike, there's no what point. boy. Well, there's no point coming back. Like he honestly, I don't come back, Mike. <laughs> like, <laughs> it's off on my it, boat, boy. It, I can't believe how good he done it. And obviously saying thank you, Vin, because uh, I'd put in a bit of graft for him before we got there, and obviously we knew the spots and. But yeah, like it couldn't have gone any better than I thought, to be honest. Oh, he's a lovely bloke. If anyone's going to catch oh, him, he's mind one of the nice him, people in a year. Yeah, lovely, lovely bloke. I like it for you. For the future, what, what when I say that to you, what what's on the horizon? What you crack on more of the same, more sip films, maybe more other media work. I don't know. Mate. I'd what like are you to think. Um, I think my sit films are going to carry on. Just carry on rolling. You never know. I might get to like part 20 or something. I think the fourth one came out the other day. I'd like to just carry on, carry on plodding through. I like, to be fair, I like the one where you went at Broad Bell and, you, and you fished. Fra- look, that was completely different. Out, you're different to what you've ever done ever. before. First time ever. Unbelievable. Yeah. yeah, I did not know what to expect. When he was like, yeah, we're going to the Alps. I'm half expecting like no one there. Just a lake. You know, like... Pine forest in the middle of the Alps, yeah. glacial lake, crystal clear water, you know, half expecting 200 foot deep lake, massive cart. We get there, it's an adventure park in six weeks holidays. There's about 5,000 people every day. There's probably about two 2,000 of them are swimming. The other thousand are on sailing yeah. paddle boards. Do you know what I mean? You've got another thousand sailing. Like It was unbelievable how busy it was. Like to the point where you drop a rod on the boat and come back and there's five different people have like wiped you out. Do you know, you get off one boat, another boat's got you. You get off that boat, another boat's got you. Like, I got wiped out. Low, like hooking carp. I saw you playing two, them through 200 them. odd yards out yeah. and you get a wakeboard come through and just oh. take your line with you. And I had that multiple times. Like, honestly, from what I expected to what I received, it couldn't have been no more different, like as different as you could possibly think. How much did you lose your head? How much was that edited? Because when in the video, you didn't look like you act like it was punishing that session because of everything that was going on, and the fishing weren't exactly easy. You caught, but you were like it was towards the end of the trip in the edit. Where, yeah, the where first it came couple of days, we didn't catch a single thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was tough. Um, you lose at any point. You lose your head with all the boat life and all that, or not? Or just I think I got frustrated a few times, but it's literally half hour. And you calm yourself down, and you smoke yeah. a fag, have a cup of tea. Oh, it's probably beers out there, wouldn't it? You have a cold beer in a fag and you'd be like, right. A lot of the time you kind of, you knew in the day, mm. you had to get your rods out in the morning because you know that in the day, it's so much carnage, you can't get your rods out. So if you did get wiped out, your rod couldn't go back out. If you cut carp, your rod couldn't go back out. You had to wait for everyone to go and get your rod back out. And obviously we're fishing three, four rods each and it will take a few hours to get all rods out. Oh, yeah. Because one rod's 300 yards that way, the other one's 200 yards that way. Do you know what I mean? And then sometimes you come back and go, I ain't happy with that and go out and do it again. And I was fully prepared to know how. Once you got there and I realised what was going to unfold <laughs> yeah. and how much carnage it was going to be, you kind of got ready for it. You like yeah, amped yeah, okay. yourself up to be, 
Yeah, no, no breakdowns. Me and Elliot got on really well. Like yeah, we before that though, weren't yeah, you? Yeah, yeah. But um saying that, friends butt heads, you know, especially when you're both frustrated at a lake, thirty degree heat. Yeah. You know. But we yeah, we we was a good little team. More of that in the future? Hundred percent. Oh, yeah, wicked. yeah, yeah. So wicked. um I think we've got a few lined up, which will be fun. Nice, mate. And then you, what, what is it? This again, guiding, just the river stuff. I love my guiding. I, I, I'd happily carry on, but to me, to guide effectively and confidently, it would have to be at the same place that I've been for a while. And I yeah. kind of feel like I want to spread my wings a bit more. Do yeah. I feel I like I want. I feel like you. I want to take the boat elsewhere. I mean, I've caught the carp out of there. I don't really want to keep on catching the same ones. I. That's why I started the guiding mm. because I could give people the same enjoyment that I had. Um, and I ain't got to catch the same fish again and again, do you know? But then a little bit of me, I mean, who doesn't want to go and fish places like the Thames or the Lee or why well, can't I go and put my boat up on the Broads or the Trent? Do you know, I think how many big rivers do you use? There's so many big rivers out there. I was thinking if I put you onto the Lee, I can go from the Lee to the Grand Union yeah, mate, to the Ewes. Next thing you know, I'm in Yorkshire. Yeah. Like, that, to, to, that's maybe what I'm... Amping myself well, Cornwall up. Cornwall with the tuna rods, mate. Corn- yeah, that's it. Just get the boat out. I'll go out. Make it seaworthy. <laughs> take it out to Mersey and I'll just go around the country and go catch a few thousand pound tuna. <laughs> Job done, mate. <laughs> no, the world is your oyster, mate. I look yeah, forward he's... to seeing where that journey takes you because one thing's for sure, you are very much, you know you who you are and you will do whatever it is that your mind will sort of fix on. And I can tell that straight away from talking to you, mate, which is a brilliant ascent to have, I think. It's how things get discovered and it's how sort of... Yeah, I think it's how you better yourself, and I, I don't think you will. You can sense it when I talk to you that you want to, you want to do something in terms of for you. I get the guidance there and all that, but it's you will yeah. do, mate. You but will do. It, as much as it is nice to see a smile on someone else's face, and a lot of these people I took and never caught a river carp before. Yeah, yeah, of course. So for them to be there an hour later and they're like line stripping, you got a carp on running running through a set of reeds. They're cloud nine, you know, and to give that to someone was like one of the best feelings ever. But as much as that, I don't have an expensive boat and pay a fortune more in fees and insurance and servicing to yeah, make other yeah. people happy. Like like I said before, I am quite selfish and it is to make me happy. That is the biggest picture of it. And as much as I love where it is and I've got my, it's a neighbourhood down there. Do you know? Sometimes it takes me an hour and a half to get from where I park my car to my mm. boat, I'll go, I'll go for a morning's fishing and I'll get there at eight and sometimes it's 10 o'clock before I even get to my boat and I've had four cups of tea. Yeah, 20 and cups of tea. Yeah, yeah exactly. and I, I love that. Don't get me wrong, I really enjoy that. But if people stayed where they was the whole life and the, then the world wouldn't move on. Yeah, mate, it's not you. I can completely sense that's not um, you and there will be a time when Maybe it's on. a bit of like, I don't know, ADHD sort of, I've done it now, see you later, I'm gone, you know? I just think that's you. I think that's I think that's healthy in a way. One thing that I was going to ask before I go on to your ending questions and stuff, you did have a job at Nash in the warehouse for a period of time. Yes, Quite a cool. short period of time. What, and this isn't, this isn't leading in any way, but for you, what about being involved within the industry again not in a warehouse capacity, but in an angling capacity? Would that be summit? Because at the moment, obviously, bait works with regards to that. You're doing a bit of filming for SIP, but there ain't there ain't like a, a massive branding push from another brand or anything. Oh, Is that right. something you'd look for or something you'd be interested in or what? What, what are you yeah, saying? Yeah, definitely. Um, I think most people who really love their fishing, love any sport, if you have a passion yeah. and someone can come up to you and be like, look, we can understand how much you love this. Here's a few things to help you along the way. I think everyone aspires to have that conversation, do you know? Of course, who doesn't want a few bits to do what they love? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and with regards to, yeah, I, I, no one, Baitworks look after me incredibly well with with the bait side of things, but I've still got to get all my own tackle. And do you know what I mean? I've, I've still got to get all my own shit. It ain't like people just throw loads of things at me. And, yeah, 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 of course. Um, but I'd, yeah, of course, I, I'll definitely, definitely work in the. I just wondered the, where you stood on that. That was just I, me. I'll definitely, I'll definitely work in the in yeah. the angling trade. But I think no matter where I went, because of how people understand my lifestyle, because obviously, uh, like you said, the sip things and where I've been about a bit before. Yeah, be on your terms, mate. Um, 
I think any tackle place or any yeah. fishing fishing brand would kind of almost appreciate that. The only reason I'm different is because I do it my own way, and I don't. And I'd like to think if a tackle company ever come up to me and said, "Do you want this or whatever?" I wouldn't have to conform to too many things. Like I'm still free. You yeah, because like, some people like you've work, got you've it? got to do this and you've got to do that, and if you yeah, don't... but I don't think it'd work for you, would it? If somebody put no. you on linear and said you've got to do a video, no, like, exactly it's that. Not, yeah, it's not. It's but not I, I'd like to think no one ever asked me that sort of thing. If if they understood me like that, do you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. it's kind of like being here's a, go and do what you got to do. We just want to. Film it or there you go, mate. I've smashed your job advert out there. Yeah, that's job it. Done, Any mate. tackle contact, ma- tackle contact shops, contact him. <laughs> He'll be on the river pirating, boy. That's it. Finn, I've really enjoyed it, mate. It's been a great insight into you. It's been a completely different podcast and loads of different elements, river fishing uh, and sort of that, yeah, pioneering, unique adventure style stuff. Before you go, you've got some quick fire questions, mate. You ain't prepped, mate. So I'm I'm waiting to see how quick you really are, mate, yeah. on this. Yeah, go on. Right, only fish the river for the rest of your life or never fish the river again? Only fish the river for the rest of my life. Just river? Yeah. That same river, you've caught them all. So what's the only question? Only fish that river. Or never rest, fish again. Yeah, or never fish the river oh, again. Oh, I'd fish that river for the rest of my life. Fair Fishing's play. fishing, mate. I love fishing. No one's ever taken that away from me. One species the rest of your life? Pike. Pike? Pike, Straight man. Straight away, Bigger mate. Bigger crocs, mate. Biggins. <laughs> You've completed that this winter. Um, three celebs you'd take fishing. Could be dead or alive. Three celebs I'd take fishing. Yeah. What, just fishing celebs or celebs in general? No, no, celebs in general. This ain't fishing celebs. Uh, three celebs I'd take fishing. Um, I'd like to sit down in the lake with Bob Marley. Bob He'd be one. Marley, Bob mate. Marley. I bet, yeah, because I bet he would like the outdoors in it, tranquil in it. I yeah, think that's a bit would, of him. I think he would enjoy it. Um, three celebs I've gone fishing. God, that's a tough one, mate. Yeah, there's a lot of choice. That's why, That's a boy. tough one. Dead or alive. Bob's back. You've brought him back, mate. He's chilling. Oh, Bob Marley's Marley. there. Oh, I don't know. I don't know. That's a tough one, Hassan. You really stuck me there. I told you it's quick fire, mate. I didn't oh, I'm going to say, easy. I was thinking about birds, but then if my missus listens to this, I'm going to get right in trouble. Free <laughs> now, because if you take a bird down there, it ain't because you're going fishing, is it? Um. <laughs> well, no. Women like fishing too, Finn. Fish Come of on, them. Mate. Fish of them. Fish <laughs> Sam Smith, you taking Sam, Sam Smith? Oi, Sam Smith, I'll take my boy down there. Sam Smith would be a Sam. Fish of them, right? So you got man. Bob, you got Sam Smith, um, someone like Shaquille O'Neal or someone. I think he would be Big funny. Shaq. Big Shaq, imagine yeah. sitting down the lake with Big Shaq. Reinforce that hole, mate. Mate, you got you got quite an eclectic mix of people there, mate. Because he's funny. I like Shaquille O'Neal. You'd have a great sing song, wouldn't you? Yeah. Oh, fair play. Um, drum and bass or country and western? Country and western. Oh, good. Uh, Favourite history carp? Yeah. Wow. Um, God. Favourite history carp? Just one. It's got to be Clarissa, man. Yeah, good. It's got to be call. Clarissa. Good call. Your idea of carp fishing hell? Braze knows one. <laughs> <laughs> Here we go. This is a good one. This came to me in a fit of very late night planning the rest of this podcast. Would you rather fight to the death a crayfish sized otter or an otter sized cray? Crayfish sized otter? Yeah, so a little otter like that. Or a big cray, otter sized cray. Crayfish sized otter, mate. Because I'd like to think, you got to remember. I peck you to death, mate. You got to remember, I've got Doris. Oh my! Well, yeah. fair play. So, like, you. But yeah, mate, do you know? I don't a think big Doris... otter-sized cray. I reckon that's an easier win, isn't it? Oh, imagine! Yeah, but you're getting arms snapped, mate. In them little yeah, clampers, isn't you? Pretty tight. That's fair scary. Oh. That's that's scary. That best piece of advice you've ever been given. Best piece of advice. I've you came been. up with some deep sayings earlier, mate. So you've definitely got some good advice. Best you've piece been given. of advice I've ever been given. Trying to think, my man said a lot of good things to That's me. That's what but... I mean. You've you've relayed a couple of them earlier on. Um, do it because you love it. Nice. Do it because you love it. Do you know? And you then things follow. You know. Yeah, I'm all. I'm a very big believer of like manifestation. Like I, the only reason we're sat here now is because I've loved fishing so much mm. that people can see it. Yeah. You know? Yeah, I love that. Final question, mate. Night in with the missus or a night out on the old boat, boy? 
I'm going to say 19 with a missus in case she's watching, but I'm lying. <laughs> <laughs> well, you could technically have your missus. No, my missus will come with me to the yeah. boat, to be fair. I need a net girl, and she's really good with a camera. My missus, spot on with a video camera. So, what more do you I ain't even got to worry about that. Job done. Finn, you're an absolute star. Thank you guys for watching and listening. I'll be back soon with another podcast. Until then, make sure you check out Wild Man on Sip and his other video that he did with Elliot when he was fishing abroad. Thank you so much, man. Thank you, Hassan. It's been a pleasure. I appreciate it a lot. Oh.